I'm going to salute y'all. It's your boy Tim Snow back here with another one. Tonight's episode is brought to you by published author Matthew Daniels. He's the author of Suicide Note and 15 other published titles right this now. Right now, excuse me. It happens to be one of my good friends. And we're going to talk about it tonight. Uh, if you like to read books, I highly recommend it. We'll talk about some of that. We're going to talk about prison, talk about life after prison and all that. This is going to be a good one, y'all. hope you tune in. And pay attention because this is a wise man right here. I'm really, really happy that he's here. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for coming, my brother. How you doing? Man, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Hey, and thank you for having me, fam. For real. For sure, for sure. Uh, and so just full disclosure, me and him actually did an episode about three years ago together about our time in Vito and how we met and everything. But that video was so blurry. And my Wi-Fi was so slow that I took it down. So we're going to cover a little bit about that tonight, talk a little bit. And this is a fella here that I'm real proud of. He's came a long ways. He's come from a, from, I don't know what you call it, from a terror. I ain't going to lie, just from a terror, right? Oh, he, he'd rob you, fight you, do whatever to a good man, working man, a, a real writer. He's knocking out stuff like Stephen King out here, man. And uh, I'll tell them how I met you, right? So my first time ever going to prison, I was in the Galveston County Jail. And I was, they called my name that night to catch chain. When you catch chain, they take you down to a holding cell. And you stay there all night waiting on the TDC people to get there. Well, I, I didn't know about them, but it was my first time ever going to prison. And I was kind of a little nervous. I didn't want to do any sleeping. So it ended up being me, Matt. And my homeboy, Lil Vic, from Lake Road in Lamar. Shout out to Lil Vic. And we stayed up riding all night. We get dressed out, change into the white clothes. We do everything. And we hit Huntsville together. And I'm thinking, oh, this is pretty cool. I got a guy from Lamar. This guy from Tech City is pretty cool. We're going we're gonna to be all right. You know, get to Huntsville, get to the gate. We go through the cages. We do all that together. And we shoot to different dorms. And I don't even see them no more the rest of the time we're there. I'm like, man, where my boys go? You know what I mean? But that's how prison is, right? So long story short, we both go through uh, transfer and all that other stuff. When I first arrived at Beto, and I mean first, first arrived, I can't even exactly remember what we were doing. Maybe he will. I'm not sure. But we were, we were all stripped down right so uh maybe going to work probably is what it was actually i think that's what it was I, it was my first day going to the laundry and i see him facing the other direction right in front of me with a giant tattoo that says texas city and i don't recognize him so i'm like yo texas city and he don't hear me so i yell it again yo texas city and everybody damn near turned around and i realized who it was i said i'll be damn how you doing bro we shake hands you know we talk and we end up working side by side, right? And we got a lot of the same story in prison. We went to the same place. I was a crib, he was a blood, but the journey was the same, right? We were we were young. We were uh, just, like I said, we were all the way in the streets. We were wild. We're hitting this wild place. And we got out, both got out about the same time. And we went kind of different directions, right? Because I wasn't, I wasn't ready to settle. I wasn't ready to grow up yet. He was. I got to admit it to him. And I, I'll tell you. And he said it's okay. He don't mind because we're gonna talk about it, right? The first time I seen Matt when we got out, he was working at McDonald's, and I shook his hand. I said, "Bro, great to see you, man. Proud of you, doing good, you know." And gave him a ride home. And when on that ride home. He seemed so different, right? Like in the in, in the previous past him, bro. I ain't gonna lie to you. Listen, you had like a egg type of personality, right? I ain't gonna lie. You had like a man, you might don't want to mess with that type of guy personality. I ain't gonna, it was obvious. When I seen you when we got out, you were working, it was a whole different person. Now, I'm not saying it was weakened down, watered down, or nothing, right? But it seemed like happy. Like it was a I'm happy to be out. The world ain't too bad type thing. Can you tell us how that changed, bro? Was that prison that changed that? was What changed the mentality from you're going to prison for robbery, you know, you're a gangster, you're blood, 
And then now I see you working at McDonald's and you're smiling. What happened? Well, uh, first again, let me just say, man, uh, shout out to everybody in the chat. And uh, I appreciate you for having me on again. And I, I really like how you started right there. Uh, one thing I learned uh, that second time that I was in prison, when I was on Beto with you, and we, you know, we saw each other on Holiday Unit and all of that good stuff. That, that was the second time I was in prison. And when I got arrested that second time for that gun charge and they were sending me down that road, I, I, I really had to think about my actions. I had to think about how my actions affected my life. And I had a good solid three years to ask myself, is, is this really how I want to live? Is, is, you know, is it worth it? Is the is the life of stealing cars, selling drugs, robbing, fighting, gang banging? Is all of that worth it? If in the end I'm going to be locked up inside of a cell, I'm being told when to go to the. I'm being told when I can go shower, when I can go eat. I'm I'm I'm, I'm told that I got to go work for free. If I don't want to go work for free, they're going to throw me into the hole and they're going to lock me up. If I if I get too far out of line, these guards they're going to jump on me. And you can fight the guards back, but you're not going to win because it's just too many of them. So really what right. I, I, I had to do is when I was on the inside, I had to ask myself some real serious questions. And this is one of the things that I wanted to come in here and talk about. And I'm going to get to the McDonald's. I wanted to talk about the concept of rehabilitation, right? The concept of, of actually rehabilitating your mind and taking your mind state from 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 one manner of existence all the way into another and see at first i thought that it was enough if i tried to change my behavior right when i came home the first time from prison i'm thinking okay i went to prison for robbery i'm going to try not to rob anybody no more i may have been arrested for selling drugs so i'm going to try not to sell drugs anymore Right. I went to prison for gang banging. So I'm going to I'm going to try not to hang out with the gang bangers anymore. And what I realized and what I want to explain to the people is it's bigger than just trying to change your behavior. What you have to do, you have to change your mentality. You have to change your mind state. You have to change what you think is right. You have to change what you think is wrong. You have to change what you think is acceptable. You see what I'm saying? And so when it came to an individual working at McDonald's, you know, as well as I know, um, there was a time when a person may look down on somebody for working fast food, especially an individual. You know, you in the streets, you looking at a person that's working fast food. They make a minimum wage. You feel like you out here, you living, the, you living the fast life. You making this fast money. You selling this weed. You selling this wet. You selling this dope. Or how I used to think, I don't have to sell nothing. I can wait for you to sell it all. I can just run in your house in the middle of the night, put that thing to your head, and then I can just take it off. And now I'm running around with a couple thousand. I'm good till it run out, and I can just go hit another lick. And so we would look down on the individual that's working the minimum wage, making that slow money. You see what I'm saying? And, you know, flipping burgers, as they say, we would think it's something wrong with that. But in our actuality, it was something wrong with our thinking. It was something wrong with our mind state. And so while I was incarcerated the second time, I worked really, really hard to change how I think. You see, I sat back and I looked at the fact that you was in there with me. We was working in the laundry together. Me and this brother right here, we worked in the laundry together on Beto. Working for free, mind you. Now, yeah, you could come up with some kind of hustle. You can you can uh, get some icy whites, take them back to the dorm, and you can sell them to somebody because they want clean clothes to go to visit or they want clean clothes to walk around the yard in. But the idea is and the concept is you're in there working for free. I don't care if you're SSI. I don't care if you sweeping the uh, sweeping the run. You're working for free. I don't care if you out there in the fields. You're working for free. I don't care if you're in the kitchen and you can get extra food on your tray. You working for free. And so the same individuals with the mind state that are looked down on somebody that's working for minimum wage because they can make that, that, that fast money. When it all comes tumbling down, you inside of this prison cell working for free. And so when my, I wrap my mind around in prison that I'm working for free, I told myself, you know what, when I get out, I don't care what it is that I have to do. 
I don't care what it is I have to do to make a uh, uh, legal and legit money. I'm going to be willing to do it because I changed my mind state. And when I came home, I put in applications everywhere, not just McDonald's. I'm going to be honest with you. But what the individual is going to realize when you do have a record is it's hard it's hard to get some jobs because you have to put on that application that you've been convicted of a felony. But the McDonald's or the uh, the, man, the store manager at McDonald's, she called me back for an interview. She put me to work and I worked just as hard as I did in there as I worked in the streets. And I told myself one thing. I say, OK, yeah, this is a minimum wage job, but I'm going to make something out of it. You see what I'm saying? Is 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 opportunities everywhere if you know what to look for and if you have the type of mind state that you're going to capitalize off of every opportunity that's presented before you. And now I'm not going to go too far because I'm, I'm going to let you ask some more questions if you want to. But just for the listening public, I got a job working at McDonald's and within four years, this is no lie, within four years, within four years, they put me in charge of a whole store. I'm not talking about I was just a manager, a shift manager. I'm not talking about I was just an assistant manager. I'm talking about I was the general manager. I did the hiring. I did the firing. I did the training. You see what I'm saying? I was in control of a multi-million dollar business. I made out. Now, I had a supervisor, obviously, but inside the store, there was nobody there was there was nobody higher than me. I made all of the decisions. So while some people may have looked at it as in, okay, Matt, Matt just working minimum wage, Matt flipping burgers, but they didn't realize Matt had a whole new mind state. Matt realized that he could make something out of nothing. Just like I did in a in a in a negative way, I realized I could do it in a positive way. And so what I saw with that job at McDonald's, I saw opportunity. I saw if I work hard at flipping these burgers, then they'll let me get on the cash register. If I work hard on the cash register, they'll let me become a shift manager. If I work hard as a shift manager, then I can become an assistant manager. And if I can become an assistant manager, I can become a general manager. And I went into it with the mind state that nobody is going to outwork me. Think about it, fam. You've been out there in the streets. When you out there hustling, you have that same kind of mind state. You know you got to get out there and go get it. You got to get up earlier than the next man sometimes. You got to stay out there later than the next man sometimes. The early bird get the worm. When, when, when individuals out there living that gang life, you tell yourself, I'm going to be more gangster than the individual that's, a, that's, a, that's across from me. If you're getting into a fight, I'm going to be more aggressive. So you already have it. Sometimes in a, in, a, in, a, in a negative perspective, you understand going harder than the next man. You understand going harder in the streets. You understand going harder selling dope. You understand going harder selling weed. You understand going harder putting that black mask on. You understand going harder stealing cars. You understand that. You understand standing on business for that. But what you got to understand is to you have to be able to change your mentality and apply that. See, those are good character traits to have, the, the, the get up and go. And you have to apply that to something positive and something legit. And when I, when, like I said, when I got that job working at McDonald's, I was flipping burgers. I never saw myself flipping burgers forever. I saw myself running the store. Let me tell you something. Yeah, that, go ahead. that says a lot about your character, right? And about the type of person we're talking to here. Because I'm going to be honest with you. You've seen a possibility where a lot of people would never see that, right? A lot of people would think, man, I got to get the hell out of here. They didn't really, because a lot of people don't have the confidence in themselves, though. What you said, nobody's going to outwork you. You know you're smart. You know what I'm saying? You know you know you count. You know what? You know you can do everything that you see being done around you mm -hmm. and want to do it. You know what I mean? Most people wouldn't do that. So that I salute you for that. Like, that's real respect. And I, I told him before we started, we was talking about that. You know what? The same people that would laugh at you for working at McDonald's, the same people that see me driving this old ass truck all around the same city I'm from, they might don't respect it, but who gives a fuck right now in our lives? You know what I'm saying? Who gives a fuck at that time? Because them same people are the ones that encourage you and be with you when you're doing wrong. But when you're locked down, won't send you a dollar, won't give a damn about you and might tell on you. You know what I'm saying? Like there's no loyalty out here. So 
it comes a point when you know you're a man or even a grown ass woman when there's no more worrying about what people think you just got to do what you got to do you know what i mean and that that's a, that's something that you arrived at faster in life than i did and and i salute you for that right i'm here now where i need to be but at that time i i wasn't but i still recognize it in you and i liked it and i i was proud of you right so oh um, we did work in the laundry together so you know what in that laundry job there wasn't nowhere to go in that though there wasn't no advancement in that you feel me like you're just trying to get through the day and you're right we work for free whether you're in the field squad host squad whatever you want to call it you even even like he said you got the best job you can be maintenance man you can be working in the office you can be an odr you can do whatever working for free still in prison so people watching this you got to get rid of that pride, right? That's a that's a uh, it's it's a sin if you believe in that or whatever. It's for they say that for a reason though, because pride will keep you from advancing in life, especially if you are a street cat. You know what I mean? Oh, uh, they you you want to impress people. And I've been there before, right? You want to impress people around you. You want to look good, everything so bad that you're willing to take a loss for it in the long run and that's not how i look at life anymore and i think kids change me a lot but when i see you and i see other people man it just makes me proud and listen i, I want to show them something right now while they're watching hold on i gotta do this so look matt has a lot of books y'all and this is no no game look you know i just did one that, uh real recently and we ran an episode last night with with Robert Hockley from Galveston and Hockley came out of prison and did something similar. But what you've done so far right now is kind of unbelievable. It's 16 books. Can you hold that stack up real quick? Y'all yeah, watch this right here. This is published books for sale. All my work right here. And yeah. these two. Hold on. Let me show them something. And then I'm, I'm going to let you finish. I ain't cutting you out. No, These sorry. two, I actually wrote while I was locked up. These were manuscripts I wrote in prison that I was able to manifest in the real world once I got out. Right. So how did how did you do that in prison? Was you handwriting on paper? You had a typewriter or what? Yeah, okay. Well, right, I'm, let me get in that a little bit. Uh when I when I got arrested. The, the second time when I went to prison before I, I ran into you on Beto, they sent me to uh to a place in Austin called uh it was a uh, Travis State Jail, mm -hmm. right? Now they I was I was a TDC inmate, but in some prisons they have a mix of inmates. You can have state jail inmates in one portion of the prison, and you can have TDC inmates in another portion of the prison. So it was a it was a a, a a prison in Austin like that. Now, I'm, I'm a, this is a kind of funny story, man. When I first got <laughs> when I first got to this prison, I had already made up my mind that I was going to do things in prison to ensure that I that I never went back. I had already began to reprogram myself. But when I when I got to when I first got to that prison in Austin, man. They, you know, they, they, they strip you down, they make you bathe, they make you put that, that, that stuff in your hair to get rid of lice or any types of bugs or whatever. They dressed me out in the whites and they, they, they gave me my mat and they gave me my bag and whatnot. And they, you know, they tell me what dorm I'm going to be housed in. And so they, boom, we all get in the line and we start walking. We start walking to our dorms. The, the first thing I seen on this prison when I walk out of one building and I'm, I'm walking through the open air and I'm going to another building, man, I literally, no lie, I see four or five dudes with like, like breast, like a woman, like, like surgically modified. Welcome and to I prison. see them all walking, uh, uh, presumably the pill car, right? And I, I, when I first saw that, the first thought in my head was like, man, where the heck did they send me? You feel me? And I mean, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, man. Uh, Austin is a wild place. I, I don't, I don't know all of. The, I never lived in Austin. I don't know the details, the the the, the in depth details of Austin. But from being locked up in Austin, talking to some of the people, seeing some of the other inmates, man, Austin is a wild place. But what ended up happening was. 
I had already made up my mind that I was going, I was going to uh change my life, right? I'd already made up my mind that man, look, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this time. I had uh three years to do. So are you saying finished. you made up your mind before you even got there? Before I but yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I made up my mind on holiday unit. I made up my mind on how I had a, a, <laughs> a tragic, a, a tragic experience that made me be like, wait a minute, man, what am I doing? This is what this not this crazy. Man, okay, well, first of all, just getting locked back up, that was total shock value. But long story short, when I was on holiday unit, you know how when you first get there, they constantly giving you layouts to, to you know, you, you getting processed in. So you got you got to go here and see medical. You got to go here and do this. You got to go here and do that. So I don't remember. I think I had a, a lay in to go go see the the, the the doctor. I had a medical lay in for some type of reason. And so by the time I made it back to the dorm, they had already changed out the laundry. You get what I'm saying? And so I didn't get to change out my laundry. So I, I had I had dirty clothes. So when they called us out to, um, they called us out to do, they called for something else. And I just fell out of place and I took my clothes and I took my lay in pass. And I was like, man, I'm finna, I'm going to force these people to give me some new clothes. And so I fall out of place. I got my dirty clothes. I got my lay in pass. I go by the laundry and I try to trade it in, but they tell me that I missed my dorm's time to uh, exchange clothes. You have certain times that you can go exchange clothes. And so they told me that they weren't going to exchange my clothes. And so I'm, I'm arguing back and forth. Uh, uh, it's, it's like a little window that, that you walk up to and you pass your dirty clothes in and they pass you clean clothes out. And so I'm looking in and I'm arguing back and forth with the guard. I'm like, man, I, you see, I got to lay in. I was in medical all day. I couldn't change out my clothes. I'm not keeping these dirty clothes. And the guard pretty much just not trying to hear it. They like, hey, you missed it. You got to catch it on the next run. So I I start, you know, I'm 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 in that aggravated mind state. I'm I'm back in prison anyway. I'm frustrated. I'm mad. I start cussing them out. I start cussing them out, you know, saying what I'd do to him if he wasn't behind the cage and yada 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 yada. I'm talking real tough, real greedy. And so I start to walk off and I'm going back towards my dorm and I'm holding the dirty clothes. But I'm like, you MF and guards, you MF and guards. If we was in the streets, I'd do this. I'd do that. You know, I'm talking to them how I would talk to them. We was face to face in the streets and I'm telling them what I do to them. But I don't want to catch another case. You, you get what I'm saying? I'm not going to catch another case over no laundry, no assault on the officer. But, I'm, you know, I'm giving it to him. I'm giving it to him as I'm walking. And so this one guard. He was like, what did you say? And so I, I look at him. So I said, man, you heard me. I, like, like I said, bro, like I said, any, any of you guys, if we wasn't in here and I wasn't in the white and you were in those grades, man, it ain't no it ain't no way in hell y'all to be treating me like this. But, you know, you got it while you in here. So he come to get in my face. So me and him, we start talking trash back and forth. So me and him, we talking trash back and forth. Lieutenant come, he handcuffed me. They handcuff me. They 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 take me off to another building. They they get me out. You know, get me out of the open air. Get me off the run. They take me to this uh building. I don't know what this building is at the time, but they just take me in here. And so I'm standing in the hallway. I'm handcuffed. And the guard that I was talking trash with, I sincerely think this dude was on coke, bro. <laughs> just how he was how he was talking, how hyper he was, just to look in his eyes. I think this dude was coked up. And so I'm in handcuffs and I'm facing the wall. And so he behind me and he like, he like got my hands and he, you know, he talking trash. He talking trash. So I'm talking trash back. Dude end up head butting me, right? Like not like real hard, but he like hit me. He hit me with his head. It was like, do something, do something. You do something, do something. And so I'm like, bro, how am I going to do something? And I'm handcuffed. Like I, I can't do nothing. You know what I'm saying? You tripping. And so he talking trash, talking trash, talking trash. And he kind of like head, he kind of like head, head butt me again. And so he kind of like headbutt me again. And so now I'm getting kind of mad. I'm feeling assaulted at this point. Not, not just pushed up on. I'm feeling assaulted. But like I say, I'm still my chest up against the wall. I'm, I'm handcuffed. And I'm like, I'm like, damn, hold on, man. Dude don't dude don't put his, he don't physically touch me twice. And so I really start cussing him out. Like, hey, bro, what the hell? Don't you don't don't do that no more. Or it's gonna be a problem. And so 
he headbutt me one more time. So when he headbutt me the third time, now I'm thinking, all right, I, I, how he's talking, how he's acting. I started believing many dude hopped up on cocaine. He he is willing to hurt me. This is how I tell you, he's willing to hurt me. So, hey, I got to do something to defend myself. So I kind of, like, from with my hands behind my back, I kind of put my foot up on the wall, and I kind of, like, kick back into him. I push back into him. And so when I push back into him, me and him, we start tussling. But, you know, it ain't it ain't no real tussle because I'm, I'm handcuffed. It's right. more or less him trying to, you know, get me to the ground and me trying to swing. I'm throwing my head back, trying to hit him. I'm, I'm throwing elbows and shoulders, you know, just doing the best that I can. And while we doing that, some more guards come around the corner. They see us. They run down there. They brrr, they rough uh -huh. me up, you know. But, you know, it, it didn't take long. I wasn't a big guy anyway. It didn't take long. I'm on the ground. They carried me to the back. They dragged me to the back. And so what ended up happening is they go to change me out. They tell me they're they finna put me in lockup. So they go to change me out. But what they did, they they really, they played me, bro. They played me. So I stripped down. You know how they, they always love stripping you down in prison. That's another thing I don't like about it. But they stripped me down. They grabbed me. They put me back in handcuffs. And then they, they, they dragged me through this back lockup butt naked, right? They dragged me through this back lockup and they put me in this room. But this, they didn't put me in a cell. You know how uh, whenever whenever you in locker and you want to go to rec, they got their own personal rec yard, right? That's right. caged in. Yep. And so they put me through the first doors to the area where it's like a uh, it's like a toilet. It's almost like a little bar that you could use for a pull up bar. And it was a small room, small concrete room, and it was another door that led to the fenced in rec yard. And so they locked me up in this like, this like little vestibule room. And so now, now mind you, I got locked up in like November, October, November. I did like about a month in the county before I caught chain. So it's about the middle of December, <laughs> right? It's about the middle of December on holiday unit. And so these doors, the, you could feel that December air coming up from the crack of the door into this little room i'm in uh -huh. and you know how it is everything is concrete and steel now i'm only thing i got on is my glasses fam that's it only thing i got on is my glasses no socks no nothing and so they locked me in this room and the temperature the temperature just kept dropping kept dropping kept dropping it got so cold, bro. It, nah, it was really like inhumane treatment. It got so cold to where the bottom of my feet, the bottom of my feet, I start feeling like, man, I'm going I'm to catch frostbite or something. So I'm, I'm, I'm so down bad to where I'm, 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 I'm putting one foot on top of the other so this foot can kind of stay warm while this foot is cold. And then when this foot can't take it no more, I put the other foot down. And then I, I stand on the other foot to try to, you know, mitigate. Hey, listen, man, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but are y'all listening to what he's telling y'all? Listen to what he's telling y'all. This man, that so that officer wasn't full of that cocaine. That officer wanted to beat your ass is what that officer wanted to do. You feel he me? Prob he probably would have did it on a different shift. If somebody, if a different uh, lieutenant or somebody would have worked, he might have been in a world of hurt right there at Holiday. You know what I mean? And so you can't win and you definitely know what they're going to do to you on an ID unit. You know, hell no, you can't win. No, they got They got enough of them to do whatever they want to you. They got chemical agents. They got sticks. They're going to hit you with, you know what I mean? Like they're going to come and then they're going to bring the big ones full of the steroids and all that. If they got them, you know what I mean? And most places got a couple of them. So yeah, it's in trouble, man, bro. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Right. But he's talking about oh, being good. butt naked in december in huntsville texas where it's freezing cold i mean for for a galveston county person that's freezing cold right we're used to it being hot down here so he's had his feet are freezing and he's having to switch feet to stay warm pay attention this is not the life you want what do i tell you all the time that's what i'm saying keep going brother i'm sorry i didn't mean to mess you from your start i had to make sure they heard what you just said because if you didn't pay attention run that back and listen to this whole little story this is something else right here 
Yeah, no, nah, no, nah, you good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you interjected like that. That was, that was perfect. And so they left me in there, fam. Man, bro, it was over an hour. I could have been in there maybe two hours, bro, in that state. And so I went from being mad, right? I went from being angry to I just wanted to get out that damn room, bro. I, really bet. Talk. I, I wanted socks. I wanted underwear. I wanted pants. I want. I wanted clothes. I wanted to get out there. Hey, I'm real sorry, talk. I don't mean I, 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 I'm not front. I got to keep it real, bro. All I wanted was to get out of that room. Yeah. And so while I was in there, it, in my mind, this, this is what I tell you about. It is it, more than. It's deeper than changing your behavior. You have to change how you think. I realized right then and there, especially in prison, I couldn't win. I couldn't win. It didn't matter. It didn't matter if I, if I felt like I had hands or whatnot. You can't whoop them all, especially in prison. You can't whoop them all. It don't matter. It don't matter how tough you is. It don't matter how many bodies you think you got. It don't matter how many people you robbed, how many how many drugs you sold. Once you get once you get locked up, once they get you behind them bars, they can do whatever they want to do with you. And then it's like I can't who who can I even tell? I can't I can't get on the phone and. And, and, and call nobody. I can't call my parents. You get what I'm saying? I can't call my brothers. I can't call my homeboys and say, "Hey, let we got let's go ride on this guard." No, I'm at their mercy. And then how they really got me is after after I was I was broke. I just wanted out the room. They finally they came and got me. I dressed out. I came out. I sat down with the lieutenant. You know how this how the lieutenant played me, bro. This how the lieutenant played me. I'm sitting down in the room with him. And so he like, oh, uh, he like, man, so man, now that you don't calm down, what is all this about? And so, and so I tell him. And then I tell him, I was like, I was like, hey man, look, yeah, I was going off outside, but I was like, man, yo, uh, y'all can't, y'all can't do me like this. That's the game I try. Y'all can't do me like this. And so what the lieutenant told me, he say, uh, he say, well, you know the um um the saw it was a sergeant that had headbutted me. He say, you know that sergeant that you had got into it with, right? I was like, yeah. He say, uh, my sergeant got a bloody nose. And so I say, that's probably because he had butted me. Yeah, you know no shit, huh? Yeah. So he was like, he was like, he was like, yeah, that's what you say. But he say it's because you started fighting back when um when they had you oh. handcuffed in the hallway and you hit him with your head which I was thrashing about. And I was like, but I was only thrashing about because he head butted me. Right. He say, all right. So he say, he say, man, look, he say, I'm just give it to you straight. He say, man, I pulled up your paperwork. He say, you know, I know who you are. I know where you're from. I know what you're here for. He say, man, I see you got charged with two years, but I came back under my old number. So I was really finishing a five-year sentence. So I was sentenced to two years for a pistol case, but I was doing three years to complete a robbery case, just to put right. that out there. So he say, man, look, you're going to be home in like two to three years. You feel me? He say, he say, now, if you really want to like continue down this road, you see what I'm saying? And try to accuse my officers of, of, of locking you in that room, uh, 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 violating your rights because I was trying to get political. Y'all violated my human rights and yada, 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 yada. I'm going to, you know, get Jesse Jackson down <laughs> or whatever. And so he say, if you can continue down that road, he say, but if you do that, we're just going to counter with it. He say, I'm going to be honest with you. You assaulted my officer and you caused him to have a bloody nose. We got the pictures and everything. He literally got a right. bloody nose. And so I was like, but I didn't do that. And he was like, but yes, you did. And so yes, I sat back and I say, all right, either, either I can accept this abuse, right? Or I can act like I'm going to fight this and then get charged with assault on the officer go back to some county jail, get a new charge, get new time. And so I was like, man, you know what? F it, whatever. And so at that moment, I, I, I realized some, I realized, especially like in prison, I can't win. It that, that wasn't my first time in lockup. That wasn't my first time being in prison, but that was the first time it, it sunk in. It right. sunk in. It right. can, I, even when you're in prison, it can get worse. When you on the dorm, it's bad, but it can, they got levels. They got degrees of bad in prison. Just being in prison, that ain't the worst. It can get worse in prison. 
And not only can it get worse in prison, you know this better. You know this better than probably anybody in the chat unless they don't been before. You can go to prison for six months and end up with a life sentence. That's real. Yeah. I, I've well, seen it. I've seen what, people Kristen, go in uh, for two or three years and get 60 years. Check this out. Our, uh, yeah. Shout out to, to Kryptonite CEO Hockley. Me and him did a video together and he was talking about, oh, uh, man, I can't even say his name because I didn't know the man, but it was a cat from from Galveston, right? He had a two year sentence, and he was two months from going home and got killed in the riot. See, see, you know man, what I mean? Nah, go ahead. No, nah, I'm just saying what you're saying is true. Like it's it can, so you can go in there and accidentally get killed on your first day, or you can go in there like Matt did, not even probably realizing that's a sergeant that he's talking to right there. Did. And look, look what he just said. Yeah, didn't even know it's a sergeant, not even not even realizing that. That's so that's an important thing, right? Because he can come head but you and he knows nothing's gonna happen. They put you in a position where they lock you in this room, then they basically blackmail you into leaving it alone because they you was gonna get convicted of that. You was gonna go to that country of what is that, Walker County? I can't even think of walker county or something i don't know what it's called up there in huntsville right bunch of mm -hmm. probably rednecks they was gonna give you about 20 years you know what i mean for some laundry and i i can totally understand why you're mad but you know what so that's one thing about prison you gotta wait your turn for everything and if you miss your turn nobody gives a shit you can be somewhere while they call commissary miss that and gotta wait two three weeks you know what i'm saying you can miss that child call because you're asleep nobody wakes you up and you don't eat for the rest of the night if you ain't got no commissary uh hell it miss parole you know what i'm saying so i think that was a blessing in disguise bro and i think that officer ranking officer that told you that he was real right because that sergeant probably wanted to press them charges on you Matt. he probably was gonna go all the way on you if it went that far and he had that bloody nose and that man right there saved him from a little bit of controversy but saved you from a major case and at the same time changed your life bro that's that's pretty deep right there yeah yeah and so and so that situation you know coupled with other things but that one situation right there by the end of that i i, I was like man you know for one i knew i i couldn't put myself in a position like that again for somebody to snatch my life you understand what I'm saying? Because it 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 I, I it got real. I realized my life could be snatched. And real quick, I'm finna get to Austin, but just like you said, bro, when I went down that last time, I was in county and I caught chain. I was in county with this Mexican. It was a Mexican, and I don't even know his name because he didn't really speak too good at English. Everybody called him Cholo because he had a tattoo that, that said Cholo, right? And he had a teardrop. Yeah. So they called him Cholo or they called him Killer. Now he was in the, this dude was in the county with me serving a trespassing charge. He had like six or nine months for trespassing, right? Did now this is I saw this with my own eyes. He gets mad at a guard for how they shaking down his house. He wrestles around with the guard, scratches him on his eye, breaks the skin, they give him two years. So he went from a trespassing charge of a few months to two years TDC. I caught chain with killer. That's what we call him. I caught chain with killer. So we went from the county jail. This is the first time I was in prison. We went from the county jail to a place called Newton. I was locked up. Uh, I was doing uh, my five years in a place called Newton County Correctional Facility. All right. But they had TDC inmates in there, uh, regardless of the name. And so while we were in there, this dude, uh, long story short, he had got real cool with, with this white boy in there that was from Dickinson. He came from Galveston County with us too. So it was several people from Galveston County. They had us in a, a six-man tank. It was a six-man tank. They had telephones in there and everything. And so and it's real talk, bro. They used to play around a lot, the white guy and killer. And they used to play the gay game. Well, you know, yeah. they'll slap each other on the butt dry hump each other for fun now i never involved myself with none of that but a lot of people and they play these they play nah, I, I definitely game. Didn't they not know. playing but they play this yeah. the gay game they sit it's on crazy. each other's lap 
Yeah, yes, yeah. You know it. See, if you went, if you ever been in there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, I got a and story so, about that later. Okay, cool. Bet. And so Killer started going too far. And the man, I, I hate I can't remember the white guy's name. I don't really want to just keep calling him the white boy, but the white guy from Dickinson, he starts to assume that Killer not playing. Killer might <laughs> Killer might really be serious when he patting him on his butt. And so he stops playing the game. Oh, no. And you so, can't, can't quit playing that game once you start. You grin you in. Man, hey, what they say, once you get in the car, you can't get back out. Right, real Once you're in the car, you can't get out. That bitch ain't stopping. So he stopped playing the game. So him and Killer stopped talking for like a, a few days, right? And you can tell Killer mad at the guy. And like, this is my first time in prison. I'm 19 years old. This is my first time being exposed to some of this. I bullshit you not. I'm oh, they had they had telephones in the dorms. This was back in like 2000, 2002. On Newton, they had telephones in the dorm, and you could buy these pre- you could buy these prepaid phone calls. You can make phone calls to the free world. So I'm making a phone call to the free world, and I'm waiting for the phone to connect, and I'm leaning up against the wall. I'm waiting for the phone to connect. And the white guy standing talking to another dude in the dorm. He got his back to Killer. Killer sitting on the bunk. Now, remember, Killer just went from six to nine months for trespassing to two years TDC, and now he in prison. And so he's sitting on his bunk with his head down and then out of nowhere he like just stand up he run up behind the white guy and it looked like he swing and punch him in the face from behind right so he like swing around him and so when he do that the white guy kind of like he 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 move he turn around he like push him off of him and so when he push him off of him killer stumble back and then he started talking in Spanish. I don't know what he was saying. He started talking in Spanish, but you could tell it's aggression. And so he started looking around. He run to his bunk. He grabbed a pen. And so he pointing the pen at the guy and he talking in Spanish, talking in Spanish, talking in Spanish. And the dude, I see him, he holding his throat. And so he started saying, he cut me, he cut me, he cut me. And so everybody looking, and I'm I'm looking. I'm like I said, I'm waiting for the phone to connect. I'm like, what? He cut you? I thought he punched him. He yeah. moved his hand, right? <laughs> and killer them bust open his razor, you know, to shave with. He done bust open his razor to shave with, took the blade out, and tried to cut this, <laughs> cut this man's throat with it. So he he actually cut it. So the dude moved his hand, he bleeding. So he tell the other guy, oh, give me a sock, give me a sock. So he get a sock, he put a sock to his throat. He trying to stop the bleeding. Just then my call connects. So I'm like, oh, snap, you bleeding for real. Now, these dorms was built kind of like in the county jail. You know, in our county jail, there's like a next to the door in the front, there's like a, 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 a metal plate with a button and a speaker on it. You push the button to talk to the guards in the picket. Because they can't see you unless they're walking by looking in the window. And so I'm standing next to the front gate and I'm standing next to the button. And so the guy's like, uh, uh, Tech City, Tech City, push the button, push the button. He cut me, he cut me. And so I'm looking at him like, I really don't want to be involved in that. No, you know no, I'm, I'm not pushing that button no matter. You got to come over here and push that. As a matter yeah. of fact, I'm really probably not even going to let you push it. Yeah, you. If, if the button get pushed, you got to be the... I'm not getting involved in that. Hell now, no. it ain't so much because, like I say, bro, he just cut your throat. <laughs> you feel me? What am I... I'm not finna get in this man's business. I'm only going to deal with him if I have to deal with him. But he just cut your throat. And so, but long story short, they end up taking him and then charging him with that. And I don't know how much time he got for it. Cause I never seen him again after that, but that's one of them stories of a guy went from a trespassing charge in the county to that's an assault charge on a guard, went to TDC, then in TDC tried to cut somebody's throat and got some more time. So he went from like six, nine months to, to years. Probably 15 years. He got G5. He probably went to Cofield, Beto, somewhere, yeah. Ferguson. 
somewhere crazy as hell. Sound like he was ready down for it, though. He was crazy from the start, tussling with the co- – so, listen, I'm going to be honest. One thing I never was willing to do is try to fight no cops. Mm-hmm. You feel me? Hey, Matt, my daughter is crying in here real quick. Uh, tell them about the books and everything, how they can purchase them. I'll be right back. Okay, okay, cool. Uh all right, yeah, real quick brief commercial break. We're gonna get into how I wrote the book. But um, like like I like I was saying, or like my brother Tim said in the beginning, um, since being released from prison, I have embarked upon my uh my 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 dream of becoming an author. I actually uh wrote my first book at 12 years old before I got into the gang life, before I got into the streets, when I was on the straight and narrow. This is what I wanted to be before I wanted to be a thug, before I wanted to be a robber, before I wanted to be a drug dealer. And how I was telling you guys that inside of prison, I corrected my thinking. I corrected my thinking and I got myself back on my, my true life's path. I, I wasn't born to be a gang member. I wasn't born to be a criminal. I wasn't born to be a rob. I wasn't born to sell drugs. I was born to have a positive impact on society. And I, I, I was I, I was born to uh, 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 improve my life. And so, uh, well, I'm, I'm actually, I see a question. Who is your put? I'm actually self-published. Um, my first book, and this is actually a book that I wrote in prison. Now, real quick. This is available on Amazon.com, Walmart.com, BarnesandNobles.com, uh, HalfPriceBooks.com, uh, almost any online book retailer. And what you want to do is just go into the search engine and type in uh, Suicide Note by Matthew Daniels. My name uh, should be on the screen, Matthew Daniels. Suicide Note by Matthew Daniels. And um, this is what the cover looked like. It'll uh, it'll it'll pop up. And so I'm actually self-published. Uh, one of the hardest things to do is get a book published. And I realized that uh, after I came home. But uh, so what I did was I found a publishing company that I could pay to publish my book. And so to publish the book, yeah, my boy got a copy. Hotel, hotel, appreciate that, appreciate that. So the first thing I did, what I had to do, I had to pay somebody a thousand dollars to publish this book for me. But um, um, like, like I say, when I when I learned um, that I had to change my mentality, I mean, I changed my mentality all the way. And I, I told myself that nothing will hold me back from my dreams. And so what I did is when I paid them individual a thousand dollars to publish my book, I paid attention to every question they asked me. I asked a lot of questions myself and I read all of the fine print and I I studied what they did for me enough to where I learned how to do it for myself. I figured out how I had to get, get the copyright, get the barcode, get the, get, you know, get, get how I could go about getting distribution, uh, how I could create the cover, how I could edit it. I, I learned all of that by asking questions from the individual that I paid the thousand dollars to, to the point to where now I self publish all of my books. I write on myself. I edit on myself. I spell check on myself. Um, the covers, I don't necessarily uh, create all of the covers myself. Like my wife helps me come up with the covers, but it's, it's, it's all internally. And I've learned how to publish them myself. So really any of my books, you can get, uh, like I say, from Amazon. That's like the easiest route. Just Suicide Note by Matthew Daniel. And um, this one, I actually wrote this on Austin Unit, what I, what I was getting into. Um, when I was locked up in, um, not on Austin Unit, on Travis State Jail. But when I was locked up in Austin, um, what I used to do um, to occupy my time, I would, I would wake up early in the morning. I would go into the day room. Um, I would I would, I would exercise. Uh, now, now I ain't writing with AI. I, I actually still have the paper copies. I actually still have the paper copies. Don't, where I wrote these don't, don't worry about the idiots, man. Yeah, and so um, what I used to do, I would uh, I would exercise. I would drink my coffee, and I would. Uh, basically contemplate what I was going to do when I, when I, when I was released, I would play these things out in my head because the mind is a powerful thing. And whatever you put into your mind is, is going to come out in, in your actions. 
And so I don't 100 percent remember exactly how it happened, but um, some kind of way, somebody that I was I was I was cool with in there, they realized that I could write really good. And so one of my uh, one of my fellow inmates that I hung out with, they ended up uh, asking me, could they pay me to write a letter for him? And now I've kind of said this before in another video, uh, and I'm pretty sure somebody has mentioned this on Tim Channel, but in prison, there's a lot of different hustles, okay? Some people, they may get extra food from the kitchen and sell that to make money. Um, when we was in the laundry, some people would get icy white clothes, take that back to the dorm and sell that to make money. Um, some people, they can draw real good. And some people, they may draw portraits and draw pictures for individuals to mail home. Uh, some people, they would make roses out of toilet paper, you, you know what I'm saying, and use different materials to color them to make them look like flowers so that people could send those home to their significant others. And so um, or they would like buy handkerchiefs. Some people would buy handkerchiefs and get somebody to draw them up, color them real nice and, um, you know, send those home to make gifts for people for birthdays and anniversaries and Christmas and things like that. And so there's all types of various hustles. And so um, an individual told me they offered to pay me to write a letter for him. Now, um, I this individual, um, I don't, uh, uh, I'm not going to really say their name or anything, but they really couldn't write too well. OK, they, they really couldn't write too well. They could write, but not well. And so uh, I, I love writing anyway. And it was to, you know, to make a little extra money, make some stamps, make some meat packs, make some soups. I was like, all right, yeah, sure. I, I'll write a letter for you. And so I began writing letters for people as a hustle and they would pay me to write their letters. And so it. Hold it on, what, what kind of letters? Like love letters or letters to their mom or what? Yeah. Mo, uh, primarily, um, it was people wanted me to write letters to their like girlfriends or their, or their wives. Like, um, cause we're, we're talking about when we was younger, there was no phones in prison and you didn't you couldn't even buy a cell phone back then. You had to write. Mm -hmm. And we were far away from home where, where people couldn't even come visit. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, yeah, that was a good hustle. Yeah. And so um, and what it what it kind of turned into is everybody can't uh, express themselves as much as they would like to. You, you get what I'm saying? Everybody doesn't. They, they can't really tap into like poetic language. Like That's I didn't why everybody understand. Can't YouTube. Yeah, I didn't really understand that that I had a, a a gift for writing. You know, like everybody got a gift. Everybody came to this earth with something that they can do that can help them survive while they're here. And I actually have a gift for putting putting pen to paper. I do that well. And this is when I really realized how well I do it is when I seen that people willing to pay me to do it. Because I wouldn't necessarily pay somebody to do it because I could do it myself. I could just write. But when I saw people paying me, I was like, hold on, wait a minute. This is something I could, I could use to better my life. And so it began as me just writing simple love letters. Like a person to tell me, uh, yo, this is my, this my wife. This is my girlfriend. This is my baby mama. They, you know, tell me basically the things that they want to say or how they feel about them. And then I, I would express that as a as an author, as a writer. I, I would write, uh, you know, three, four pages, depending on what they paid for, of, you know, pure romance to, to make the heart melt. And so uh, when they would send these letters off and they would actually get the response letters and other people saw that, more people was like, oh, wait a minute, man, Tech City, he got something with that pen. Say, so can, I, can it, I be uh, real, real quick though? Hold on. Yeah, go ahead. So I would see that going on, right? And I even helped some people write some letters before, not at, not at, not charging anything, but you know, just homies. I would always wonder. I wonder what this girl gonna think when she know his illiterate ass just wrote. How did he write this four page love letters? That's good. You know, they yeah. they don't even they don't even click to think. He can't even barely write. Look at this letter. They'll write one back, huh? Yeah. Oh yeah, they wrote back, and and I'm glad you said that because what ended up happening is uh all right you 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 you've been in prison before man and a man in prison they mind is gonna go some places when they thinking about they women you understand what i'm saying especially like when you you actually can't see a woman well you can see the guard but you can't see a woman you can't touch a woman you can't hold a woman your mind 
your mind is gonna fantasize about these types of things. And so you 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 love that type of correspondence. That's why they, they even read books that, that talk about romance and uh, uh sexuality, or they'll look at magazines that, that touch on that. But to get a letter from an individual that's that that's talking about this subject is is superb. And so right. what individuals start commissioning me to do is they started commissioning me to write like short stories, fam. This, they, they would pay me to write. Now, depending on how many pages they want or how much they were willing to pay me, it could be anywhere from two pages to 10 pages. It didn't matter to me. Just, all right, have you however long you want it. But they would pay me to write the story in such a way as if the characters in the story is the man and his woman. And right. um, just to give you some examples, some of the scenarios I would use is an individual's first day out. I would describe the individual's first day out um, to, to paint a picture in their woman's mind of, you know, how it's going to be when they get out, you know, getting them out, taking them out to eat, taking them back to the room or taking them back to their house and the Fantasy. things that they, yeah, the things that they're going to do in, in great detail. And so um, I started writing a lot of letters like that. And and just, and just like what you're saying, when you would think about how the woman was going to react, I, I used to feel uncomfortable, right, writing things of a sexual nature to somebody's like yeah. significant other. I was you just thinking, I don't even think I'd want them to write no shit nothing like yeah, that to my yeah. yeah, 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 bro. And so in my mind, I, I would kind of feel uncomfortable, but it was like, you know, they were like, oh, no, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. They just want the letter back. Mail, mail call is important in prison. And sometimes an individual may have, they may tell me that they have went uh, several months without getting a letter, right? And they would just want to say something in a certain way to get that response. You get right. what I'm saying? People right. want to hear their name at mail call. And so when they realize that I could write a letter that would get responded to or that a high that had a high probability or a high chance of being responded to hey they 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 were willing to let me write and it, it got even I, i'm not gonna say weirder but kind of weirder but it you know it is what it is the women would write back in response to what i said yeah. and so uh the, the they may make they be like hey tc tc she wrote back she wrote back she wrote back hey check this out and I'd be like, bro, I, I kind of feel like this an invasion of privacy. I don't really, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I don't really want to read what your woman wrote, bro, uh, uh, on an no, intimate shit. level. But they'll be like, but if you don't read what she said, how are you going to be able to? <laughs> how are you going to be able to like really respond? You got to so know her now. You know his old lady's fantasies. Yeah. So it was it was several instances, bro, where I was writing back and forth. With several people, women, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like not on my own behalf, but on theirs. But it, you know, it always felt kind of weird. But it was like, hey, you know, it is what it is. And so from that, one of my friends, I was locked up. He was from Tech City with me. He, you know, he was like, man, he was like, man, you are just, you are just write books, bro. These are like many books. They're short stories. You, i am just write a book. And so I was like, man, it, it hit me. I remember when I wrote my first book when I was like 12 for a school contest. And I was like, you know what? I, I can write a book. I can. And so I, I began to try to write a book. Now, this is where I, I want to tell somebody, whenever you're chasing your dream and whenever you're trying to um, um, overcome your situations and become successful in your own right, Success is what you define it as. You don't have to live like somebody else to be successful. You only have to achieve your dreams and goals and aspirations to be successful. So sometimes when you're trying to be successful, there are hurdles that you have to overcome. And so one of the hurdles that I had to overcome is when I attempted to write my first book, I couldn't get past halfway finished, you know, and I could have given up. But I had already changed my mind state to where I told myself I will not be denied anything in life ever again. There's nothing I can't do. Even if I think in my heart that it's something I can't do, 
I'm going to convince myself in spite of that I can do it because I know if I convince my brain that I can do it, my brain is going to figure out a way to get it done. And so right. uh, the first couple of books I tried to write, I couldn't finish. Were you handwriting? You didn't. You didn't tell me. Were you handwriting them? Did you have a typewriter? Oh, oh no, nah, no, nah, I, I didn't have a typewriter. I was handwriting them. I would, um, I would uh, buy, um, um, you know, you could buy like little notebooks. You could buy like little notebooks from the commissary. So I would buy notebooks from commissary, and I, you know, buy pencils. So I was writing them with just with just pencil. In a in 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 a second, I still got uh like the physical manuscripts of these books I was writing in prison. I I, I can show them to you. I can show oh, you I know, what I wrote. I know. Yeah. Yeah, I can show you what I wrote because I, I me, mailed them home. Let me ask you something, right? Oh. Uh, yeah. So I never ever heard anybody on any YouTube prison channel never white, black, Mexican, and most most of it's targeted to black folks, but everybody reads them. Is the urban novels that are so popular in prison? I never in my life knew about a ur what an urban novel was, right? So I get in here and I'm seeing, uh, I want to say it was Zane and a bunch of them other authors that was real popular. And these novels are for like hood type people. I don't know how else to explain it. And they're, they're pimping, they're hoeing, they're drug dealing, they're robbing, they're all, they're wild as shit, these urban novels, right? Yeah. But I've often looked at them and they're basically you kind of breaking up. I don't know if it's me, but it's breaking up a little bit. Is it breaking up? Can y'all hear me? Let me know in the comments if y'all can hear. It's all right because I can hear you fine. I don't know what I what I was saying. Hopefully you can hear me. Is uh so those urban novels, right? I always looked at them though and said somebody that's good at writing can knock these out real fast, real good. You know what I'm saying? And then we get I see suicide notes, right? It look like it's and frozen. Oh shit! Yeah, that's. Oh you. wait, hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh yeah, all right. Yeah. I, I, all right. Well, go back a few seconds. I, I couldn't hear what right. you said okay. about urban novels. No, what I was saying is when I would read them, I would realize that somebody that was good at writing could knock them things out quick. You feel me? They, they, they're, they're basically the same plots over and over again. They, they're not very many pages. The print on the pages are a little bit bigger, and. They're money makers. They make a ton of money. You know what I'm saying? Did you see them type of books in prison and, and, and get inspired with that type of genre at first? Like, I mean, because I know you do everything now, but was that a was that an idea for you when you seen them? Yes. Yes. And that's that's how I crack the code, so to speak. See, the um the first book I tried to write, it was like a science fiction book. I wanted to write a book about an individual going back in time, getting getting lost in the past and, you know, doing all kind of sci-fi stuff because I'm, I'm, I'm into that. I'm into time travel, space travel, aliens. I love that type of genre. And so I wanted to write a sci-fi book. But what kept, what hindered me from completing the book is in order to make the book real and believable, you have to have knowledge of the subject matter that's why a lot of authors um, um when they're writing a book you'll hear them they'll say well i'm doing research for my next book i'm doing research right. for my next book that's because if you want your um your character right let's say if in the storyline your character goes to paris france okay but you've never been to paris france it will be difficult for you to convincingly describe Paris, France. So you would have to research Paris, Paris, France. You would have right. to research the structures, the culture, what it looks like, the restaurants, the the what, what goes on in Paris so you can make it believable. And so what I found is when I was writing my books and the individual that went back in time, he went back in time and he popped up in Africa somewhere but I didn't have enough knowledge about, you know, 10,000 BCE to convincingly describe it and, and describe right, right. the cultures. Right. And I, I you know, you got a prison library, but I didn't have access to the information to do the proper research. And so at first I didn't realize that that was my problem. I just felt like I had writer's block. So I couldn't finish a book. But really, it was because I didn't have knowledge 
of the setting that I wanted the book to take place in. The setting, you know, the time, the place. Can I ask you a question real quick? I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. No, nah, you good. No, nah, it's cool. So why didn't you write one about prison while you're sitting in prison? Uh, well, again, I it was it was like a process. You feel me? It was like a process. At first, I just wanted to write what I like. So I was trying to write the um like sci-fi, science fiction. And so what happened was it the idea just didn't pop in my head for whatever reason. That's like the short answer. You probably could have wrote the best uh prison movie ever while you're sitting in prison. Yeah, you're not now that you say it. If 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 somebody would have dropped that jewel in my lap, I definitely would have ran over the, the finish. I would have ran over the finish line with it. I definitely would have made the touchdown. But yeah, you know how it just did not dope right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, hey, I can still go back. But so, but what happened was is those urban fiction novels were being passed around. And I came across people like Zane, and one of the main ones was Eric Jerome Dickey. And yeah, so I when I got my hands on one of those books and I read it, right? When I read it, it was like a light bulb went off. Remember I told you, once you convince your brain of something, your brain is going to figure out a way to get it done. So when I read that urban fiction novel, a light bulb went off, bing, and I saw in those stories, I saw gang banging, drug selling. I saw robberies. I saw, a, I, I saw it was the urban fiction. It was the street life. And I was like, wait a minute, I've lived that. You see what I'm saying? I've been up all night, rocks under my tongue. I ran from the police. I've been in high speed chases with the police and got away. I've stolen cars. I put the black mask on and, and, and you know, told somebody, give it up. I've done that. I've done that. I, I've been shot at. I've shot at people. The stuff that I'm reading, I'm like, oh, whoa. I don't have to research this, right. right? And so what I did, I say, well, you know what? I can take the skeleton of my plot because I love plot twists. I don't want the author to know what's going to happen until I tell him. And so I knew, I was like, I could take the, the, the skeleton of my plot, you know, and I can put the setting in the streets and I can make my character street people and I can write the book without doing no research because all of the research has been lived. Right. And so that's when I wrote a book. That's when I wrote the book Suicide Note. That's how I was able to finish it. You, you understand what I'm saying? Because the, the Suicide Note is a uh, urban fiction novel. It is an urban fiction novel. The main character is a 15-year-old kid from Dickinson, Texas. And uh, Dickinson, Texas, is a city in uh, Galveston County. I wrote, hey, one, I wrote my books um, in cities that I know. You see what I'm saying? So I don't have to read. I may have to research parents, friends, but I don't got to research Dickinson. Let, let I don't got to research Texas City. Let me do this, Matt. Look, yeah. It says, Matt Daniels was born in Texas City, Texas, to two loving parents. The youngest of nine children, he always had a love of reading and writing. And he learned how to do both before he even started school. Matthew completed his first short story for a school contest at the age of 12, and he won first place. Deep down, he always knew he wanted to be an author, and he always reached for that goal. Matthew also loves to read, and he owns a personal library, which boasts over more than 400 books. Matthew Daniel still lives in Texas City, Texas, with his beautiful wife and three children, and he looks forward to publishing many more novels in the future. Man, listen. I'm so proud of you, man. It's crazy. Bro, do you know how refreshing this is? Listen, I I don't hear nothing from people that I love except jail, uh, J-Pay, Securus. I mean, man, bro, it's 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 so where we live, the only way to uh how we grew up is to disconnect from people, right? Like, man, you love them but they're not living how you live right now. You know what I'm saying? You won't run into them at work. They're still on the streets and all this type of stuff. How do you balance having a wife, three kids working with just living in an area where it's just kind of foul? You know what I'm saying? From your last job where I used to see you, man, you got dolphins and bombs all around and stuff. Like how does, how do you stay so focused on this path, bro? Like where you're so concentrated, you can write 16 books now. 
you're staying out of jail, you're working, you're literally, you have a beautiful wife, beautiful family. Oh man, it's just, it, how do you do it, bro? Like, how do you guarantee yourself you ain't going back? Yeah. Um, the short answer, and then I'm going to go into it, but the short answer is what I keep saying. And I, I keep saying this for a reason because I wanted to, I wanted to really marinate in somebody's mind. It's not enough to change your behavior. You have to change how you think. You understand what I'm saying? It's, 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 it's not enough to just change your behavior. You may think because I oh I, I stopped hanging out with the game. I stopped going to this place. I stopped using drugs. It the behavior is that's not enough. You have to change how you think. And so what I did, and this man, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you, bro. When I was in prison the second time, when I ended up running the UNB though, before we went home for three years straight, I'm not, I'm not lying, I'm not lying to you, fam. For three years straight, every single night. You wanna know what I did before I went to sleep, bro? I sat what? on my bunk. I looked at the walls and I, I I burned that feeling into my mind. I burned it into my mind on how uncomfortable I was. I looked, I looked at that, that, that sink toilet combo. You feel me? I, 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 I tuned in to the noises I heard out there on the run. I, 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 I embraced the feeling of that, that thin mat and that hard metal bump. I looked at them bars. I touched the wall. And I, I told myself, never forget how this feel. Never forget how this feel right here. Because that's why people go back. And well, you know what? That's why I went back. I'm I'm nah, I'm, man, I'm, listen. I'm, I'm, I'm a person. I'm, I'm sorry, right? Oh yeah, yeah. So that's that's look, Matthew Daniels TV right here. All right, that's it right there. Oh, uh, I'll pin it. So listen, I've said that before, bro. I love what you just said. I have said this before, right? It's it's a human nature. It's a human nature. And, oh, Jojo, of course you can. Yeah, he asked Cuddy. I thought he meant Cuddy. Of course. Yeah, that's my bro. Drop it in there. Oh, uh, and drop it in there every so often. If you're going to watch, that'll be cool. But listen, so it's human nature, bro. I, I took this back all the way to kids, little children that are abused, right? Whether it be physically, sexually, whatever, to sometimes grown people. They're so traumatized by events stuff that happens that they mentally block it out do you know i don't, can't remember very many times i ever went to jail and i didn't get jumped at least one time right uh be hungry every day always miss the free world sitting on these steel benches hurting my butt you know what i mean hurting my back do you know every time until the last time as soon as i stepped out that door i said man that wasn't that bad Exactly. It was, though. It really was. Like, it was that bad, right? But something about human nature, you step out. And so that's why I guess a lot of big homies, older cats come and they tell the young kids it ain't that bad because they block it out their mind, right? So my last bit in the feds, I'm not very a real religious person, but I definitely believe in God. You know what I prayed, bro? Swear to, I'm not playing. I prayed that I don't forget how this feels. I'm not kidding you. I would pray that, Lord, please, just because the way that I would feel sitting in there, right? I didn't ever want to break them. I didn't ever want to commit a misdemeanor no more. I'm like, this sucks. I, I'm too old for this right now. I had a Mercedes, a Lincoln, a pickup truck, living in a nice spot. You know, I had everything in life that you want. And I went back being greedy, right? So I hated every day of being in the feds. I didn't like, I, I would have good days, right? But I literally hated every single day of it. And I knew that I'm liable to get out of there and go, man, that wasn't that bad. You know what I mean? But it, but at the time it is so that you said that, that you embraced it, you soaked it up, you sucked it in. That's almost something you have to do, right? Like if you're trying to mentally block it out, you get out, don't think about it. Or you say it wasn't that bad. You're going back. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You're going back. So that's something for real. You know what? I wanted to get a little off topic, though, real quick. I'm sorry. And go backtrack on what you said earlier, because it meant something to me. And I was talking about it on Facebook today. You said, oh, uh, what did you say? Something about you couldn't call for help. You couldn't call your brother. You couldn't call your mama. You couldn't do anything. Right. Mm -hmm. Tell 
can you describe because you're a very good speaker you you're very good at expressing yourself can you describe that real true feeling how you feel when you're leaving that man's office and you realize you just got assaulted but you had you were about to go get 15 more years maybe like you really knew that man i just got played and i can't beat these people right what is the how does that really feel when you hit that realization dog it's um it's something akin to what they call rock bottom you know i i i honestly and i'm not i'm gonna be 100 real i felt helpless i felt hopeless and i felt powerless and i i realized that i had put myself in that position i realized that because of my thinking and because of my behavior i gave somebody the ability to treat me like trash and I couldn't even defend myself. I had, I had no, I had no win, none whatsoever. Now, yeah, I, I was, you know, I was talking trash. I was cussing them out. Yeah, I was, I was doing all of that, but I was handcuffed. I was taking it to that hallway. Dude head butted me three times before I even did something. And the third time when he, when he did it the third time, the whole reason why I pushed back, because at that point, I was like, okay, you trying to hurt me now. It ain't just you just pushing up on me and you're a little too close. You're trying to hurt me. So it's like, hey, if you're going to hurt me anyway, might as well we just going to hurt each other. You, you get what I'm saying? Listen, but, at that at that time right there, did you re- was you really realizing, because you was young, was you really realizing how many people they didn't kill in them prisons in that same situation right there for little to nothing? Man, oh, yes. Because remember, I was in that room before i had that conversation for several hours bro you understand what i'm saying it wasn't 10 minutes it wasn't 20 minutes it wasn't 30 minutes it was to the point where i was like well are they just gonna leave me in here you get you get what i'm saying like what what's really happening right now like i my mind bro went to all kind of different places about what was going to be my actual fate because like i say here i am I had nothing but my glasses. That's it. And I'm I'm free. I'm freezing cold to the point where I'm feeling like my feet are about to catch frostbite. Like I'm cold, pain cold, pain cold, bro. Hands hurting, face hurting. Like, bro, when I say I was standing one foot on top of the other, I wasn't standing up straight. Right. I was I was crouched down next to the uh the, the the toilet sink combo trying to get like in like a little corner area away from that door where that wind was coming up on so and listen so, and, why, and, why and, this is happening are you telling yourself man these people finna beat me to death or what's going to happen right now yeah oh at, at, at that point everything and that's and that, that's what shook me up because at that moment everything was anything was on the table anything right. was a possibility or they are they gonna leave me in here until i freeze to death you 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 hear about stories where they they say an individual was left inside of a cell unattended to for weeks months and then yeah. when they came and got them they was dead in the cell at that point yeah. i'm not knowing when i'm coming out you you get what i'm saying as 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 five minutes turn to 10 10 turn to 20 20 turn to 30 30 turn to 40 40 turned to 50, I had to really start asking myself, when are they going to let me out of here? And when they do let me out, what are they going to do next? Like, what are what are they preparing for me? What are they plotting on doing? My mind even went to places like, okay, this can't be legal. You understand what I'm saying? This They have to be violating human rights. So right. what are they willing to do to cover this up? You feel what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. What are they willing to yeah. do? And are, are, are they going to take me out of here and finish me off? Are they going to take me out of here and put me inside of a cell somewhere? Well, you know, I just get I get lost in the system where I thought I was going to come through two, three years and go home. But now I'm going to end up with, with 50 years, never, never come out again. Because when you in prison, you know about uh, uh, levels to prison. You know about... um um. Uh, uh, line change. Well, I think what's that actual term when you line class? Yeah, you you know about line classes. You know how you can 
you can literally get put in worse and worse situations. You can literally be put in a cell where it's 23 hours lockdown. You can literally get put in a cell and they don't gotta, they don't gotta let you out. They don't gotta feed you. They bring you your food. They don't gotta oh, they feed got, you. They got uh TDC got wings that are like six man wings, dungeons where, yes. they, where you're, you're locked yes. in. Your doors yes. behind doors. They got anything you want in there. Exactly, exactly. So me knowing this in that moment. I had to consider everything. Everything was a possibility. I even had to consider is is this how is this how it's going to end? Is this is it over? Are they just going to leave me in here till you know there's nothing left? Or are they going to take me out of here? And cause see, when they first took me back there, at first I thought, okay, they they finna lock me up. They finna put me in lockdown. No big deal. I've been in lot of I did lockdown before because I've been in prison before. But the fact that I had no clothes and I I wasn't in a room. I would I didn't have a bump. You get right. what I'm saying? I yeah. wasn't in a traditional lockdown cell. So nothing about this was it wasn't normal prison. You this know what it like, sounds like they had you in? It sounds like they had you in one of them dry cells that they take people to. Listen, if they catch you swallowing something and visit, mm -hmm. they take you in there and make you make you uh use the restroom three times before you can get out. I think it sounds like they had you in one of those, if you want to know the truth. There's yeah. nothing in there. It's just a locked room. That's it. Well, no, yeah. no, it was it was a toilet. Oh, and it was uh it was uh the room was connected, it was like a door. Like I could actually look through that door and see the uh the rec yard, the outside rec yard fenced okay. in. It was like the little room, but like I guess the lockdown people they go into that room and then they open up the next door and they go out there and play basketball or whatever. But the thing yeah, is, that. that's, yeah. that's what messed me up. Because they didn't put they didn't put me in a cell. You see what I'm saying? They didn't put me in a cell. And so when I was in there, I I'm I'm knowing nothing, nothing about this makes sense. And at some point, like I say, I'm wondering, like, man, when they when I'm you know I'm, when they gonna come get me. You understand what I'm saying? Like, man, right. I, I want to get out of here shivering. shivering. They know what they're doing to you, they're trying to break you before they, they talk me. to you. Not trying and, and not trying, did. I, I ain't no ain't no use of me lying, ain't no use of me front. I'm not trying to paint no, no, uh, no, I'm not no super, I'm not no, I'm not Superman, I'm not the incredible hook. You get mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I'm a human, I got a breaking point. Yeah, I temperature affects me, isolation affects me. I wasn't in there, I didn't come out of the you know, stronger than ever. That didn't embolden oh, now. No, that made me realize something that made me realize I had no power. And I had and then when I was sitting across from that from that lieutenant. You know what I'm saying? Already feeling uh uh de like I like dehumanized. You know what I'm saying? Because even even with that, you gotta think in your head, like like you, you still wanna hold on to some type of some type of manhood and masculinity, and you know what I'm saying? Like, hey man, I you know, I'm 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 a man, I'm gonna stand up for myself. But it Absolutely. was an understanding of no matter how tough I thought I was, I couldn't win. You feel me? That it is sunk in. It's sunk in. Because even if I'm sitting across from this lieutenant, I'm knowing if if I go too far, they can put me back, and I can't stop them. You understand what I'm saying? I can't right. stop them. That's how. That's how. That's how a lot of people uh, in in the free world they 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 get victimized and they get abused because an overpowering force, you know, imposes their will on them. You know, even me going to prison for robbery. Me with, with, my, with me and my homeboys, we got guns. You got nothing. We are overpowering. For, it's either you submit or die. So that individual that I'm making submit, you get what I'm saying? That that that, that doesn't feel good. But you know you had you can't win this because I got this. You don't. You see. And so I was in that situation where I can't win that. No matter what I think about myself, no matter how angry I get, no matter how mad I get, no matter how unrighteous or how, how how much of an injustice it is, I can't do nothing but submit. Mentally, right. that's that's hard to accept. And then when he told me that they could charge me for busting a dude, no, bro, that was it. After yeah. that, and then him looking me in my eyes, telling me, "Hey, well, you know, my sergeant got a busted nose. He bleeding." You did that, bro. We listen, you with that. That the same officers ran that same play on a hundred different people that year. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? They want to know what you got hanging behind you right there. 
Oh man, uh, I'm really into Egypt. You know, I'm really into Egypt. So I, I bought this little backdrop a little while back for when I'm doing videos or whatnot. That's um, Ampu, one of the Egyptian netters named Ab Ampu, uh, more familiarly known as Anubis, right? Uh, just from uh Egyptian mythology. You know, I'm, I'm really into Egypt, so I, you it know, I, I like dope. it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, shout out to your brother, right? I seen the scene on my phone. He's live right now. He's live all the time. His brother, we have a video, two videos, I think, on this channel. His brother with King Y from Cold Figure TV on YouTube. Oh, and, tip, shout out. Yeah, yeah. King Y needs to come on my channel again and let me come on here as one of the two. I've been I've been trying to get him to uh make a move, but I can't catch him. He's live all the time. You know what I mean? But He's doing his thing. So he's like on his third YouTube channel right now, monetized, you know, so he's he's a powerful speaker. You're a powerful speaker. Let me ask you a couple of things. So your story goes to a lot of what I said right uh, the other night. And you probably didn't watch. I know you didn't get to. Uh, but I often talk about the lack of transparency inside of a prison and how helpless you really are. There's a lot of people since Facebook popped up and all this, they talk about. There's, so there's a lot of women, moms, probably even some dads that like to call the wardens and complain about the food and about it being cold and all this type of stuff. With 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 the I don't know, like, do you think the prison system in Texas, the way it is right now, is ever going to change? Like, is there ever going to be a time where there's some transparency in the system, do you think? Or do you, do you feel like I do? I'll say what I feel. Right. And you tell me how you feel. I feel like the people of Texas want us to suffer. I feel like they like prison to be bad. They want you to be hot in the summer. They want you to be cold in the winter. They want you to work like a slave. They don't care that they locked you in a room for hours naked and freezing cold. Do you feel that there'll ever be a change in our society? Or do you even feel like Texans feel like that? Or, or how do you feel about that? Uh, well, short answer, then I, you know, I'll expound. No, I personally, I, I wish it would, but I don't, I don't think it's going to change. I think is it's like that by design. And I, I believe that that's just how the that's how the prison system is, you know what I'm saying? I think that's how the prison system is. And one of the one of the biggest issues is is and you know the, some of the inmates themselves, some of the inmates themselves, bro, are savages. You get what I'm saying? They are they are savages, bro. They will do anything at any moment. Now I'm not saying they 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 they, they not human. Don't don't misinterpret me. But I'm what I what I what I'm saying is. Let's say, even with me going in prison, wanting to wanting to change my mind state and be a better person, you get what I'm saying, and 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 rehabilitate myself. At the same time, I wasn't disillusioned that everybody think like that, and I knew at the drop of a dime it's kill or be killed. You see, and so as long as you have. Uh, uh, within the inmate population, individuals willing to prey on each other is going to be hard because it's not it's not just the guards that make it hard. It's some of the inmates that make it harder on other inmates. You see, I've seen people, bro, this, this real talk. I've seen people come in there, young guys, you know what I'm saying? Young guy, 18, 19, 20 years old, coming there. Hey, they may just be trying to do their time. The, the matter of fact, I'm going to tell you this, this happened on Beto, man. Young kid come in there. He's trying to do his time. He got like three years. You know what I'm saying? Tall, skinny kid. Uh, they called him Slim, right? He uh he got a job in the laundry on Beto unit. So he's uh he's a white guy. So prison, don't get me wrong, you you can interact with members of the opposite race. That's not just uh, unallowed, you know, you can do whatever you want to do, but a lot of it is segregated by race, right? Especially like with, with who you hang with and who you click with. And a lot of times when you go in there, your race is going to come to you and pull you in. Or if you're in a the game, they're going to come to you. They're going to, they're going to pull you in. You know what I'm saying? They, they, they force a lot of people into these, into these groups. And I've even seen people prey on members of their own race to force them to get down. So this guy, he comes into the laundry. As they say, wide eyed and bushy tail, 19, not really understanding the savagery that goes on in prison. The, uh, the the woods, they pull him in. So we're all working in the laundry. You got 
the uh, the individuals they working over here on the dryers. You got the individuals over here they folding clothes. You got the individuals over here they washing the clothes. You got the individuals over here they're loading the clothes up on the truck because on Beto unit they did laundry for another unit that wasn't big enough to have his own laundry. So so everybody got their different jobs. So this kid fresh in prison, fresh with a three year sentence, they end up um basically trying to rape him. I'm gonna just get straight to it. Uh, behind the dryers or whatever. And so these people, he he thought they were his friends. He thought they were going to protect him. And so that's why he hung with them. And so, but then when he found out that they wanted to violate him, he got scared. And then he did one of the, one of the worst, unfortunately, he made one of the worst moves that he could make. Now, if you're in prison, unfortunately, if you're faced with something like that, you have to defend yourself. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it, sh it shouldn't be different. But hey, it is what it is. So you listen to this. You ever get locked up? You face with that situation. You defend yourself. You you got you got to go off in their mouth. You ain't got no choice. You got to defend yourself right then and there. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. He made the wrong move. He went to the guards uh -huh. and he told. He told uh -huh. man. And yeah, y'all hear Tim in the background. It ain't happening. They not going. They're all. They are not going to help you. The guards do not care. They don't care. And then they're gonna tell the people that you told on. They're gonna tell them that you told. Yeah, so yeah. this kid, what they do, they take him out of the laundry and they they move him around. So I don't see him for a while, right, bro? I ended up. Uh, I I, I got I got through in lockup for like two three weeks, something like that. Uh, you know. I, I went off in the hallway coming from child one time. I don't know what. I think I was really mad because I hadn't got no letter in a while. You know how it get. I'm mad because I ain't got no letter in a while. A guard said something to me that I ain't like. I cussed him out in the hallway, you know, handcuff, boom. I get thrown in lockup uh, two, three weeks. They let me out. They, uh, they moved me to another dorm. Now, this has been maybe, I don't know, five months maybe. Six, six months, maybe, since I saw this kid in the laundry, I filed into this dorm. This is the new dorm that he's on. When I tell you that he was a full-blown female, now he oh. wasn't a female, but I'm saying he was living his life as if he was a girl. Turned out. Yes, all the way. He had a girl name. He was walking around the day room. With his shirt tied up, you know, putting putting cool offs on his lips to make it look like he got on lipstick. He twisting around. He's sitting on people's laps in the day room while they playing dominoes and whatnot, you know, getting passed around. And I guess uh, when I met him, he wasn't uh, like homosexual. That wasn't who he was. But um, when they found out that he went and told and they found out that, you know, he wasn't going to defend himself. And he just went to the new dorm. Word got to the new dorm. And so they just, they, yeah, they just vic they victimized him. And they victimized him to the point to where he, he accepted his, his fate, I guess. And he was like, okay, well, I guess psychologically, he convinced himself that this is what he wanted as opposed to what this is what was forced on him. And so when we're talking about the, uh, the, 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 the prison system changing, and how the state of Texas is and how the guards is, that's all true. But inmates prey on inmates as well. So even, even if the guards, you know, try to change their behavior, who who's going to change the behavior of the inmates? So I no, honestly, no, listen, I honestly uh, don't think it'll change. That's something that Kryptonite said on, on a video I did with them, right? Some people are just uncontrollable period right some people you're going to end up having to lock them down in that box for life it's just is what it is they're going to keep killing people they're going to do stuff like that i've often wondered to myself why sitting in jail why we make it worse on ourselves at all times why do we have to be like this right but you know you said we're humans that means we're animals you lock any animal in a cage especially so the definition of a wild animal, right, is free range, go wherever it wants, do whatever it wants type stuff. And that's what we are as free people. We're basically wild 
you lock this wild animal inside of that cage and he gets animalistic tendencies. You know what I mean? Like you said, since you were trying to change and do right, you're well aware that you're on veto and a lot of these men never even going home again. They ain't no changing. They're, they're locked in. You know what I mean? This is what they do. They're, they're bloods. Can you talk a little bit about the gang shit and how, how serious it was or not serious in your opinion or, or what, like the uh, activity what you've seen like from the black side from the gangs yeah uh well primarily gangs run prisons because it's so many of them the various gangs they can they 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 can almost not really move with impunity but certain officers be in league with certain gangs as well like uh I, I don't condone any type of gang activity. I'm not a member of a gang, but I do have a history. So let me just say that first. I don't condone no gang activity. I don't support no gang. I'm not no gang member. I'm an upstanding member of society, and I detest some of my actions that I've been involved in in the past. But uh, the first time that, that I, I went to prison um, when I was 19, I didn't have the mind state that I have right now. And um, I didn't understand how some of these guards work uh hand in hand with the gangs i i did i didn't understand that to, and that's how they have some of this control but um when i was when i was locked up the first time back then you could take your own shoes in the prison with you and so when i went and turned myself in just really being stupid i had some candy red gangster nikes they started selling these like candy, they had candy red, they had candy blue, uh, gangster Nikes that they, they kind of look shiny. That, and that so everybody, I mean, that everybody's gonna notice and everybody gonna want when you get to. You see what I'm saying? And and, and and me, bro, like not fully understanding, I didn't want that kind of attention, thinking it was like you know, bad thinking, thinking it was cool. You know what I'm saying? Thinking out, oh, I'm so tough, I'm gonna wear this in there. You see what I'm saying? Not not realizing how many problems I'm gonna get into. Right. So at one point they sent me to uh to uh this unit in Sugarland called Central Unit, right? Now I go in the Central Unit. I'm not even there a full day, right? But when I walk into my dorm, I walk into my dorm. I got those shoes on. So every everybody see it. So boom, automatically I made enemies. That I didn't even know I made, which is a dang, which is a dangerous thing, and I may have made some allies that I didn't know I made, but I I I, I put a target on my back, and I didn't know that I was putting a target on my back, just young and dumb, really, and so I'm in there, I'm chilling, I you know uh uh some of the bloods they see me, they see my shoes, they come up to me, they automatically know what it is. Hey, I see them shoes, you banking? Yeah, what's it? Yada yada yada. Where you from? Yada yada yada. Boom. Where you been? You know, oh, I've been on this unit, been on this unit, just where I'm from. This is what I'm locked up for. We start chilling. It just so happened it was a kid from Texas City in there with me. Now he was he happened to be a blood too. And so when he went off to school, he let me sit in his bunk and use his headphones. So I'm in his, I'm in his bunk. I got my headphones on. I'm li I'm listening to music. You know, I'm just jamming out. And the whole time. It's people plotting on me behind my back, you know, mm -hmm. that I don't know, that I don't know nothing about. So I'm sitting there, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I think I told you about this the last time, but I'm sitting in there and I'm, I'm chilling. And when he come back, he come back and he tell me, he was like, uh, he was like, hey, uh, uh, hey, man, don't, you know, don't get, don't get too, I don't remember exactly how he said it, but he was like, don't trip out. It ain't nothing big. It ain't nothing major, but uh, uh, they want to check you. And so I'm not understanding gang lingo at the time. And so when he's saying somebody want to check me, like in the streets, when they say somebody want to check you or you say you check somebody, that means you like you punk them out. You you know, right. you treat them, you treat them like a hoe and they ain't do nothing. You got checked. If I walk up to you and I backhand you and you don't do nothing, you got checked. I walk up to you and I punch you in the face and you don't do nothing, you got checked. If I walk up to you and I take your stuff and you don't do nothing, you got checked. So when he said that, I was like, I was like, man, what you mean, man? Ain't nobody going to check me. As in, 
Ain't nobody going to do nothing to me, and I ain't going to do nothing back. I don't know, I don't know what y'all got going on. But the, the idea is these individuals start because I have on these shoes, because I'm claiming to be a gang member, in prison they, they have rank, right? And so the individuals that have the rank, they, it, to them, you know, and I didn't go along with this at all, but they feel like they can tell other people below them what to do. So it was like automatically, automatically, because I, I was claiming to be a gang member, because I had on these shoes, it was automatically assumed that an individual could just tell me what to do. You don't, you don't know, you don't know me. You don't know my name. You don't know where I'm from. Right. But, but this gang has put me into a hierarchy. Okay. And so, and as a matter of fact, I, I, I want to get to the guard. So uh, I'm going back and forth with him about ain't nobody checking me. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. And he was like, he was like, oh no, um, they, you know, they, they just want to, you know, get out there with you. You know, yeah, just I get out there and fight like a heart check. So I was like, oh, I'll, I'll fight anybody. Like, you know, what's up? Who, who is it? What, what, what they want to do? Yeah, what they so at? he was like, yeah. So he, he was trying to tell me like, well, now they, they still talking about it. Uh, 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 I, I don't know. I'm not 100 percent sure. I'm just telling you, just be on the lookout. I, you know, I heard them talking. I just don't want you to be caught off guard. So come to find out, and this is how sick, and, and from my mind state now, this is how sick that gang culture is in there, bro. It was a blood from another tank. He wasn't even in the tank with me. He was a blood from another tank, just um, but how they had it was like four pods around a central control booth where the guards are at. And so if you go to the bars, um, you can kind of see into these other uh into these other tanks. And on central, you, you have like cubicles. So it may be about like 30 cubicles in the one that I'm in, 30, 60 cubicles, however many it was. And so it was a guy in another in another cell that had seen me walking through or whatever. He was talking to a crib that was in my dorm. Now, this is this is what how it got real weird. And this was really outside of all kind of gang politics. But it was the 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 speaker for the five deuce hoovers in my tank. And so he felt highly disrespected. <laughs> he felt highly disrespected on me coming in there with those shoes on you see and so he wanted some uh huh i said that's crazy oh yeah he felt highly disrespected on me coming in there with those shoes on and so this dude that spoke for the five deuce hoovers and another dude who was i think he calls him a five nine king out of dallas uh uh blood in a in, a, in another tank these two guys right these two guys are talking about you know me and my life and so they basically had set up a fight or they were setting up a fight between me and 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 a, a, a crip one of his underlings the five dudes who one of his underlings because um one thing that they will try to do uh they're they're like like it's not necessarily like i was 19 135 pounds they really weren't going to send the guy 6'6 six, six, 250 to heart check me. They're going to damn near try to match you up with somebody by right. size. You know, now sometimes you got to fight somebody big. It is what it is. But generally, they're going to try to match up with somebody your size. And so, uh, or in your weight class or whatever. But it's never uh, uh, another gang heart checking you. It really wasn't a heart check. He was just pissed off because of my damn shoes. And he wanted to get at me. But he had to get at me in a certain way so it wouldn't be a ride, I guess, right? You can't just be a You know, in the, in the old days, shit, still now, if you come in saying you're a crip of blood, your people a lot of times will shoot the opposite one at you just to see how you react. That might be the check right there. You know what I'm saying? You're a blood, so they're going to send a crip in there. You know what what disrespectful names he going to call you, and they want to see what yeah. you're going to do. That's that's the play they was going to try it on you. You know what I mean? Man, that hey, you you right on. See, I I didn't I didn't I didn't even I didn't even realize that, or I didn't I didn't even catch that, especially uh -huh. at the time being 19, because you know jail is a strange place. You know, do some of the rules. All right. But that's exactly what they did. It was a crip dude, but I kind of. I kind of sidestepped the play when the guy told me that somebody was trying to check me. And I was like, hey, look, nigga, check this out, bro. You from Tech City. I'm from Tech City. Give a damn about anybody else. You going to tell me who who the F in here 
is talking about, you know, they, they want to get down with me, bro. We finna, I'm, we finna get right to the chase because I'm not understanding this. They talking about it. They talking about what? I don't even know. I don't even know these people. I haven't even been here for 24 hours. I'm fresh on the unit. And, and at that time in my mind state, I was on a whole nother level. Like, bro, I'm not listening to none of y'all about nothing. I'm me. My OGs was my brothers in the streets. I never took orders from nobody. You know my big brothers. My, my big brothers, they created their own game. I was a dark side pyro created by my big brothers, and we made a name for that set right where we at. So I, I knew no authority. You get what right. I'm saying? Yeah. I, I didn't understand that. I knew no authority. No, you go. I knew no foot soldier activity. So all I wanted to know was who talking about they want to fight. And so he was like, oh, all right, all right. They, they, right now they talking about it's going to be him. So I see this dude. He's standing up in his bunk. He got his headphones on. And you know, like when you work out in the fields, you be having like, they give you these white gloves sometimes, yeah. you know, yeah, to protect yeah. your hand. So I see him. He's standing there. He got these little white gloves on. But I'm still not peeping that because it's the first unit I've been on with a whole squad. So when he tell me to do it, I get up. I boom, I walk over there. So I whoop, I walk up to his cubicle, I get in his face. I'm like, hey, he take off the headphones. I say, hey, man, you uh, you talking about you want to fight me? You got a pride on me or something? Like, what's up? He say, oh, well, they said, and he start talking, I cut him off. I say, don't, I don't want to hear no they, them, none of that, bro. Like, I'm my own man. You should be your own man, too. Like, did you say you want to fight me? Like, you got a problem with me? Like, what's up? Like, do you want to fight me? Is Do you got a problem with me? And so he was saying, like, I ain't got no problem with you. I don't, I don't even I don't even know you. Yada, yada. But they say, I say, bro, I told, I'm not trying to hear no they, them. I don't care who the, who the fuck is the damn they. You, you get what, what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm like, who the fuck is the they, bro? Like, nigga, I heard. You feel me? I heard that you was talking about that you wanted to fight me, bro. Man to man, do you want to get down or not? Whatever. And so he was like, uh, well, he tried it again. He was like, he was like, man, look, man, I don't I don't I don't, I don't even know you. You coming over here, did this. I said, all right, uh, enough, enough of that. Enough of that foolishness. I say, nigga, you want to get down? Let's get down. So I was like, hey, and I didn't even know this, like where they fight it, but it's obvious when you're in there. So I'm like, bring your ass to the back. Because in the back, it was like a little open area where the toilets and the sinks was at. So I was like, well, fuck it. That's all I need to hear. Nigga, bring your ass to the back. Nigga, let's get it in. But as I'm walking to the back, now I'm, I'm it's really settling in that it's, it's some conversations going on about me that I don't, I don't know nothing about. And so I wanted to make my position known. So as I'm walking to the back, I tell them, I say, hey, I don't know what the fuck y'all got going. And can I cuss? I don't want to. Yeah, you okay. can. So I'm like, so I'm like, I don't know what the fuck y'all got going on, but nigga, my name is Matthew Daniels. I'm from Tech City, Texas. I, I I'm not nobody motherfucking foot soldier. Can, don't no nigga tell me to do shit. I say, but if any nigga in here wanna get down, we gonna get down. But that's on the strength because I'm a man. But don't nobody make me do nothing. So I don't know who the hell, you know what I'm saying. So I'm, I don't know who the hell saying this, saying that. That all that matters a damn, nigga. Anybody wanna get down, we can get down. So I go to the back. Me and old boy, we knuckle up. Now I don't. I'm not gonna lie. I don't whoop him. He don't whoop me. We throw. We throw hands. You feel what I'm saying? We throw hands. We brrr, we get in there. We get in there. We get in there. Then we kind of like wrap up. We wrap up. We touching around and we hit the cubicle. Now the cubicles are kind of like metal. So when I hit it, it kind of like make that noise. Boom, like reverberate. And so I hear the guard, the guard, the guard. And so me and the dude, we kind of like break up. And I see him. He dropped down and he crawls and he crawled into somebody's cubicle. So oh, yeah. I just I like I say, I don't know the procedure, but I I I can peep the plate. So I did the same thing. I dropped down, I crawled around, and I just crawled in somebody's cubicle. And they were like, they were like, sit down, sit down, sit down. So I sit on their bunk next to him. The guard come in. We well, know the guard come to the bars, like, hey, what's going on in there? What's going on? Everybody like, no, nah, nothing, 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 man. We good, we good. It ain't nothing, ain't nothing, ain't nothing. God like, hey, what was that noise? What's going on? I'm yeah. like, nah, it's good, it's good, it's good. So the guard uh uh leave. You feel me? So when the guard leave, this when I find out who's setting it up. So then the five dudes Hoover dude, you know what I'm saying? He was like, uh, he was like, nah, that that wasn't good enough. They gotta go again. 
So I look up, I see the nigga, he say, he stand up. You know, he got his shirt off. He done been locked up for a while. He kind of he kind of yoked up. No, nah, that, that wasn't good enough. They got to go again. This is what he say. And so uh, so the dude kind of like, he, he falling in line. He ready. And so uh, so I'm like, so I'm like, see, whatever. I don't give a fuck. But I'm knowing in my mind, yeah, you want us to go again. Cause you wanted your homeboy to you wanted your homeboy to drag me back there. Nah, 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 nah. You're not just finna get in and just beat my ass, nigga. You feel you know what I'm saying? Nigga finna beat my ass, nigga. We gonna we gonna fight and I'm gonna fight hard. So I'm like, well, nigga, let's get it again. So we go back there for the round two. We go back there for the round two. We boom, we lock up. Now this time, like I say, I ain't gonna front. I didn't whoop him. He ain't whoop me. I hit him more time than he hit me. I tell you that goddamn much. But we lock up. So we lock up, we 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 Boxing, boxing, boxing. We end up wrapping up again. So we tussling. So I hear some people, no wrestling. Stop wrestling. No wrestling. Stop yeah. wrestling. All right, nigga, it's a fight. I'm doing whatever I got to do to win. He doing whatever, whatever he got to do to win. We getting it in. So we tussling around. Boom. We fall on the ground. I hear guard, guard, guard. We crawl away again. So we crawl away. I go into a, uh, 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 I go into a, uh, uh, a, a cubicle. He going to a cubicle. So now, so now uh, the guard come this time. He come in. He come in. He walk around, but you know he don't do nothing. He don't see nothing. Like I ain't banged up, but he ain't banged up. So he go back out. So when he go back out and, and he leave the 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 five dudes Hoover dude he again. Now he got he got to go. Man, come on, man. Again. Right? And I and, and I know he's saying this because like I kind of got the better of that one. I hit him. Right. One time. I got him more times than he got me and, and old buddy. And he, he ended up being my partner, so I ain't trying to, you know, knock him or nothing. But he's starting to get a little shiner. Now, I'm, I'm, I don't know it at the time because I don't got a mirror, but I don't got no busted lips. I don't got no busted nose. My eyes looking like my eyes when I came in. He is turning black. You feel me? And so his partner mad because he ain't whoop me. You get what I'm saying? So he like, y'all got to go again. So I tell him, I say, hold on, bro. I say, nigga, didn't you hear what I told you, fam? I say, I'm not no motherfucking foot soldier. Nigga, don't tell me to fight, and I just go fight. I say, nigga, you want to see a fight? Nigga, you come fucking fight me. So he like, he like, oh, I already seen what you got. You ain't got nothing for me. You ain't got nothing for me. I already seen what you got. Oh, and so man. now I'm, 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 I'm peeping it. Oh, motherfuckers, they try, nigga size you up. You get what I'm saying? That's what everybody, they're going to size you up, bro. And so he say that. And I, I'm like, I don't give a damn about none of that. Nigga, if you want to see another fight, you, me and him just went twice, you come back there. So, whoop, I go to the back again. You feel me? So I go to the back again. He was about to come out. And then it just so happened, another nigga that was in it just so happened to be a blood. I, I guess he had had enough. He wasn't even with the foolishness. He stand up. You go, you know what I'm saying? He was, they was like, oh, no, nah, no, nah, fuck that, man. Y'all ain't finna back though to little homie. You know what I'm saying? Little homie got hard. Little homie got out there two times. He ready to get out there with you. But he was like, no, nah, you ain't finna back do him. And so then, like, Bloods and Crips start standing up. So now I'm like, oh, okay. I'm starting to see who in here with me. All, all right. around. And so now it's like a tense situation. Like, is it going to pop off or is it not going to pop off all over this? And so everybody like, nah, yeah, yeah, nah, he right, bird low right, bird low right. Y'all ain't finna back door to little homie. Y'all ain't gonna back door to little homie. And so the dude was like, nigga ain't trying to back door him. He calling me out. So I'm like, you goddamn right I'm calling you out because I already told you, bro. I'm, nigga don't make me fight. But if anybody want to fight, nigga, we can fight. And you sound like the one that want to fight. So yeah, for up. real. Yeah. And so then, you know, everything ended up calming down. And so, you know, I ended up, I had problems with the blood nigga that set that up the whole time I was there. Like, we was cool, but I never really, ever since then, I just didn't really respect him too much. Y'all like, bro, nigga, you set me up, and I didn't even know you. But what happened was, and um, just to go back to my original point, because, you know, I just wanted to tell that story for the platform. But what happened was, like, the next day, or maybe the day after that, but I think it was the very next day, they had assigned me to the whole squad. And so whenever you're in the whole squad, they call you out early in the morning. So they call you out early in the morning. They line up everybody that's going to go out into the fields. And y'all all walk single file line to the back gate. Y'all walk up to the back gate. They unlock it. Everybody go out. They lock it back. And you go out into the fields to work. So I'm walking uh, out there to the field. And so it's several guards walking with us. And so one of the guards, it was this black dude. 
he walking and he kind of like positioned himself like next to me. And so he's walking alongside of me. And so he was like, uh, he was, he was like, hey man, where you from? And so I look at him, so I'm like, man, I'm from Tech City. So he was like, he was like, oh, all right, all right. He was like, man, what, what dorm you came from? So I tell him. And so he was like, he was like, oh, you a, you a blood, huh? And so I look at him. So I'm like, so I'm like, no, nah, man, I, ain't, I, ain't, I don't do no banging. You know what I'm saying? So he was like, oh, you ain't no blood. So I was like, uh, so I was like, no, nah, man, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't, you know, I don't do no banging. I don't do no banging. And he say, uh, he say, uh. He say, he say, he say, man, you ain't, uh, you ain't getting to a fight with, I forget the dude's name. He's like, man, oh, you ain't getting in no fight with so-and-so, so-and-so. So I'm thinking I might be in trouble, like, for the fight. So I, you know, I'm, I'm like, man, I don't know what you're talking about, man. Like, you know, I ain't had no fight with nobody. I just got here. I ain't in no gang. And I'm just trying to do my time. But then the guy ended up telling me that he was a blood, the God. So he tells me that he was a blood. He was, he was like, man, now nah, ask so-and-so about me. You know what I'm saying? Like, nah, you ain't no trouble, man. He was just- That's the crazy plot twist you like, huh? Yeah, yeah. He was like, he was like, nah, I, I, I just heard you held it down. You know what I'm saying? He was like, man, I just heard you held it down, man. I was gonna say shit. You know, it's like, you need something. Holler at me. But so like, let me tell you like, something. Look, yeah. check this out. I'm sorry to cut you off. That's- Nah, you good? Yeah, then now we appreciate that fire story for the platform, right? Do you know, so when I first got to Beto, all the white laws was looking at me every all the laws was looking at me right like oh shit he's finna get ground up he's out of there you know what i mean and a couple days later when i come out to sell and i got like a little little puffy eye and a busted lip or whatever but i'm still walking with the same homies man you know some of them guards hit me with a thumbs up going down that bowling alley oh yeah they was, they was proud they was like shit they so them guards right there had to be the ones that didn't want to see people fail, right? It wasn't all of them, but it was a couple of them. Yeah, they hit me with the thumbs up, like, oh, you made it. You you going to stay. You're all right. You know what I mean? So that what you're telling me, uh, yeah, I can see it. You know what? Uh, there was a guard where I was that was actually a crip. He would tell you that he was a crip. He wouldn't say ex-crip, none of that. He'd say, I'm a crip. You know what? I was on a little unit transfer that the uh, lieutenant, I think, or captain, I can't remember which one of them, his daughter was married to a crip. So – he would do anything for us. This is all country, white, East Texas dude, right? That would do anything. You had, hey, I need to get my homie moved down here. Can you throw this case away? Like, so that goes to back to what you said when we first started, that certain officers be allied with certain gangs. You know, in South Texas, South Texas and them prisons, they, the guards speak Spanish, bro. You got Mexican mafia family members, Texas syndicate family members working in these prisons. You know what I mean? Like, you can be in a position where you can be a black man right or you could be a white guy you go down to a south texas prison where all these boys from the valley got their hardships that down there the guards are speaking spanish like it's there's a lot of situations that you can be in that why this is not the life you want you know what i'm saying and he's telling you some good stories right here i hope everybody's paying attention and let me ask you something did you have to go at nine because you said something about nine earlier today oh uh, no 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 i'm good i'm good Okay, no, okay. If y'all yeah, watch this in the comments, it, yeah. So if y'all have any questions in the comments or anything, drop the comments. And I appreciate if you drop your location, let us know where you're watching from. Uh, so we're right here in Galveston County. Like we said, he's he's got 16 published books right now. You do the 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 word of the morning. What is that you do every day? I can't remember what it's called. I'm tired right now. The, oh uh, no, you good? Uh, morning motivation. I, I'm glad you kind of segue into that. Um. My latest, uh, my latest book series, man. You know what? Hey, can I share my screen real quick? Yeah. I don't know how. Yeah, it'll work. Yeah, let's see if it, if it pull up. If if it do, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna show this real quick <clears throat> while I kind of talk. Hold on. Yeah, let me put this up right here. This is this is the book I have. I have two of his books that he autographed for me and signed. This is Suicide Notes by author matthew daniels right there that we're looking at talking to from a convicted convict armed robber to a convicted uh excuse me to a good father hard-working guy so we okay there you go hold on yeah can you see that yeah hold on yeah they can see it i can see it kind of right. it's not you, that you, great because we're in, we're in damn uh landscape mode 
Okay, well, I, I, I'll put it down. You think it'd be better if I just hold up the physical books? Yeah, you got the books in here. That's what I wanted. Yeah, we need okay. real factual proof who we're talking to right here. I want them to see them. Yeah. And okay. So okay, you, I, 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 I have something I wanted to ask you, though. So yeah. one of the one of the uh, best subscribers I have, Gypsy, right there, the one mm -hmm. that sent the super chat earlier, was saying suicide notes, right? We're going to get that book. Let me ask you this before we get started. So there is a question right there. So I did tell them to ask questions. So then we'll get to the question in one second. Which book out of so a, a new reader, if you was going to introduce a new reader to you, author Matthew Daniels, which one of your books would you bring to a new person to get them hooked on what you write? That's the one I want Gypsy to buy. Suicide. No, my, my first one. It is My suicide note. Yeah, yeah, suicide note. Now, if they into like a, a if they not into like the the urban fiction, the hood stories, I would suggest another one. But it's it's it's, all, it's almost like from the feedback I've gotten, right? From the feedback I've gotten, bro, from from writing it in prison, passing it out to people that was in there with me. This gotta be uh my most well written one. I like them all personally, but a uh, suicide note. Um, they 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 bought it in other countries, literally, and I I get nothing but good feedback about this one. And I guarantee. Let me you you know, I'm sorry. So I I want to tell these people that my mom is the person I know in this world that's read the most books of anybody. Right? She's a speed reader to where she'll read two three big fat novels in a day you know what i'm saying she that's what she does my mom's retired now she'll sit down uh feed her little chicken she's got scratch her dog and read two three books right i gave her both of your books first before i ever got you know when you brought them over mm -hmm. i gave them to my mom and i said mom i want you to read these first and you tell me how you like them when she's seen them She's like, nah, I ain't gonna read those. I say, mom, my friend wrote these, and she remembers you. You know what I'm saying? I say, my friend wrote these. I want you to read them and tell me how to how they are. You know what I'm saying? You know what? She gave me both books back and said, man, he's good. She said that, and for my mom to say that, man, that's a big deal. That's a real big deal. Uh, somebody's asking how they can find your books. Can you tell them the website or, or whatever's going on? Uh, okay, all of my books. They're, they're, uh, Amazon is the, is the easiest place, but on any, almost any online book retailer, Amazon, uh, Walmart.com, BarnesandNobles.com, HalfPriceBooks.com, a whole plethora of other ones, um, you can get it. Just when you go, just type in the search engine, uh, Suicide Note by Matthew Daniels, because uh, some book titles, there are several books with the same title, and um. Some may be more popular than mine, but um, if you put in Suicide Note by Matthew Daniels, this will pop up and you can go straight to Amazon like right now, straight to Amazon right now and order a copy. All of my books, all of my books are available on there. Look, so uh, even though I got the physical copy, I got them from myself that I just typed you in on Google. I just wrote Suicide Note by Matthew Daniels on Google and he's got two T's in his name. So make sure you use the two T's. Mm -hmm. And man, listen, we would appreciate like hell any anybody that supports. We're not here asking for no cash apps, no donations, nothing like that. This is a man right here that has a family that he supports. You know, he's telling you how far he came in life. It's pretty amazing. As you see now, if you've been watching this video, why well, I said I got a lot of respect for him. I'm proud of him. And I really am. Oh, uh, Matt, somebody asked a question. I don't want to ignore it because it was a few minutes ago. I'll let you finish. They say, how important is commissary in prison? Do they really feed you a little bit, like not very much food? Okay. Uh, well, if you don't have any commissary and you're only eating the food that they provide, you you can survive. All right. Now, they're not going to overfeed you. Don't get me wrong, but you, you're going to eat enough. There's plenty of people that don't have commissary. You're not going to you're not going to starve to death. There's plenty of months. While I was locked up, I had no money. I had to survive off what the state provided, and you can't survive. But how important is commissary? Like, if you can get your hands on it, it, it is immensely important, for one, because you can choose what you want to eat because you may not actually uh, want to eat what they have down there at the chow hall. And sometimes you may not want to get up and go. Sometimes when they call breakfast, it's early in the morning. 
And if you don't get up and go, when they call your dorm, you're going to be starving until lunchtime come. And also, it's just um, commissary is money. Now, yeah, some people in prison, they get actual money, right? But for the most part, uh, commissary is money. It, 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 it gives you the ability to do your time more comfortably, right? Um, to participate in the prison economy also, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what that's what commissary allows for you to do. Um, something as simple as clothes, right? I, I'm, I'm gonna keep going back to that because me and uh Tim, we worked in the laundry together on Beto unit. So at one point, I was I was selling clothes for commissary because uh, whenever you whenever you get the standard issue clothes, like when you change out, you take a shower, you get in line to get your new set of clothes, you might get underwear that got holes in them. You might get pants that are stained, shirts that are ripped, and stuff that don't even fit too good. And sometimes it's, it's not clean properly, and you may not even want to put it on your body, but you get you get what you get. You you really can't stand there and, 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 and argue with the individual that's passing you your, your clothes. You see what I'm saying? You got to get what you get. Now, uh, if you know somebody that's behind the cage that's handing out the clothes, sometimes they'll have good sex to when they see their homeboys They'll give them a good set, but the average individual, you you gonna you gonna get some raggedy stuff. And so, uh, if you got commissary, you can pay for nice clothes. You see what I'm saying? But like I say, that commissary just gives you the ability to eat more, to uh, choose what you want to eat, and like my boy so eloquently said, participate in the prison uh, economics. Um, even like uh, I, I remember on on Beto, <laughs> on Beto, bro. That was one of the first units I went to, to where they like sold like weed and cigarettes just so openly. You know what I mean? Oh, it was oh. crazy. So you can even not not saying I condone any of this or anything like that. I'm just telling you how it is. If like you like to smoke cigarettes or something like that, you're gonna need something to trade, right? Or to pay for it with. A lot of times you can do that with your commissary. You know you. Pay for your cigarettes, you pay for your weed, or you pay for your hooch, your, your prison liquor, whatever your whatever your poison is, or tattoos. People get tattoos while they're in prison as well. You get those tattoos with the commissary. So as far as eating is concerned, you can survive on only what they provide, right? You can, you know what I mean? But you got to make sure you get up. You got to make sure you're ready to fall a lot whenever they call breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And, what uh, I say uh, earlier when you talked about that story on holiday with the laundry that everything you miss your turn you're out of there right yeah yeah when they and, and, uh, on, and on a lot of units they only open the doors at certain times so let's say you you're in your cell and this this will happen and they call for a lunch call right they may be calling for lunch and they may be three row row light. You may be on the third tier, the third floor. They're going to hit that button. All of those cells are going to open up. If you're not outside of your cell, ready to come down those stairs to get in line to go to lunch, when they hit that button and roll them doors back and they lock, you not getting out to eat. Hey, and, you want to hear something cold? Can, huh? Let me, let me tell the viewers something cold, right? You wouldn't believe. I'm talking about would not believe how many times I wanted to go to breakfast. And I woke up when they rolled the doors for everybody to come back in, and I missed it. Yeah, yeah. and you stuck. You I'm stuck. stuck. I'm hit. I'm hit. No I'm food, saying? nothing. So, I, I got to So at that point, so man, I'm gonna let me let me iter, whatever that word is. I can't say. Let me let me talk about that for a second though, right? So yes, yeah, see what he's saying is you will basically what he's saying is you won't die if you eat the prison food, and that's all you eat. You will live, but it is not nutritious. It's not. It doesn't taste good. It's not nutritious. And it's a basic amount. If you're Muslim, Jewish, and don't eat pork, do you remember what they used to eat? The bean trays, double beans? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a segment in Texas prisons that all they eat probably for dinner five times a week, because that's how much pork you're going to get, is a double scoop of beans and two pieces of cheese, two slices of cheese, you know, sandwich slices. So do you remember this? Do you remember the old school cats that, that were doing life and all that that would stand by the trash can and ask you, are you going to finish that? Man, yeah, y yes, yes. People, 
Like literally, what you don't eat, they want that off your tray. You know, it, it ain't all always- out of trash where you're getting ready to dump your tray in the trash. They don't know what you've done to it. They want it. They hey, let me get them beans. Let me get them greens. Let me get them beans. Let me, they will sit there and just eat off everybody else tray. So yep. he didn't say it. He his opinion is not exactly mine, right? Because I believe after a long term eating that, you will wither away, right? Because you're not getting the proper amount of calories. I believe over time a man will deteriorate. And something that I seen Matt going in into there into this maximum security environment, right? I had seen movies. I, You see homies coming home big and swole from prison and everything and all this. When I went in there, I seen a bunch of people looking gray, pale. They were looking like they were dying. You know what I'm saying? They were looking sickly to me compared to where I just came from, where we used to go outside and shit like that because they would run recreation so rarely. If you wasn't in whole squad, you probably wasn't going outside because, man, they... When we were there, bro, do you remember that they would run wreck about every maybe once a month? If you was lucky, you might go in the gym and once a month you might go outside. Yeah, it wasn't regular. It wasn't regular mm-hmm. at all. It wasn't mm-hmm. regular at all. And so when you got the opportunity, like I say, you got to make it when them doors roll open, you know, because people and then people, that, that's why and I'm glad you kind of brought that up. That's why people that do anything to get out of that cell. Some people go to school just to have somewhere to go. They'll go and to they church just, just to have somewhere to go. You remember really? Schoolhouse was the one. That, so I don't know if I talked about this. If you go to a Texas prison without a diploma or without a GED, they're going to enroll you in school, right? You'll do fields half a day and school half a day. That's pretty much going to be your job. And and uh, that sometimes is a blessing because the schoolhouse has air conditioner. So the guys don't like to go down there, right? There's people that don't get their GED on purpose and keep going to school and all that. But this life... It's foul. He was talking about the clothes. Bro, you know how many times I switched in my good boxers and then was mad as hell because I got something with some piss stains or some doo-doo stains on the back? Yep. I mean, like, they're not caring what they give you. When I was in Die Ball, there was this laundry captain, and that's what they call him, y'all, the, the, the prison boss, whatever, of the laundry. He's the laundry captain, and all the other officers work under him, and he controls it. But this guy would stand there right there as you change clothes, right? And you throw your clothes in there and he would call out the size instead of you. Do you know every black and Mexican on that prison, he called out their size too small on purpose. And he did mine the same way because I hung with them. Like the white guys could walk around in clothes that fit. The blacks and Mexicans are walking around in little tight, little uh, nut hugger looking weird. You know what I mean? So there goes back to the commissary question where we had to buy clothes. And this is the crazy part. That same captain, when he would see a black or Mexican walking around in some good fitting clothes, would want to find out what dorm you're in. And they're going to come do a necessity shakedown. Remember those? Man, you talking about uh, when you say die ball real quick, Duncan unit. Yeah. I've been there, bro. I yeah, did that's what's awesome. That's, I know exactly that's what, what you, butt naked that's what, die ball, man. That's what Dale is right now. But naked dog ball, bro, they strip you so much, man. That's all they do, fam. <laughs> but naked dog ball, for real. Hey, you said that earlier. Shout out to you, dog. What's up, man? Chat, I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm. Let's get to this chat for a minute. So listen, uh, okay. hold up the first one of your books you want to while I get to this chat right here. And and uh, see if anybody said If y'all want to say anything. Yeah, free Saucy D. So, yeah, Saucy D is over there on Die Ball. We talked about suicide notes. Hold up something else. Put it closer. I got like a little glare, I think. Okay, there you go. Which one is that? Now, this one is called uh, Thicker Than Water. I wrote this one after I wrote Suicide Note when I was locked up in Austin. It's another urban fiction novel, Thicker Than Water. Uh, It's available on all the same platforms that Suicide Note is available on. This was the second book that I uh, that I uh, I wrote while I was in prison, that I actually got published since I've been home, right? Uh, the third book I got published. I'm, let me do a rundown of these sixteen, just so they'll know. Yeah. This ain't no cap. This ain't no cap. The third book that I got published is this one. It's called uh, Big Game Hunting. Now this book is kind of different. Uh, what this book is is after I came home. 
uh, me and my brother that he was just talking about, the one from Core Figure TV, we had made up our minds that we wanted to build our community up, the same community that we had torn down. So we wanted to get into uh, politics, but we didn't want to just get into politics from a regular standpoint. We wanted to hold the crooked cops uh, 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 accountable, the crooked politicians accountable. We wanted to directly address the individuals that was putting fake cases on people, uh, beating people up in the streets, uh, uh, assaulting individuals in the streets and making laws that we didn't agree with. And so this book here is actually, uh, this is nonfiction. This documents a period from 2010 to 2016 when my brother and I were actually uh, heavily, heavily, and we still are, but heavily, heavily involved in the community exposing corruption within our local uh, police department. And that says a lot, too, for an individual to come from a background like, like we had, from actually being released from prison, actually having a criminal record to challenge the powers that be, that's, that's very dangerous. So this one is big game hunting. This one is actually nonfiction. It's all true. It's all real. Um, that's available on all of the platforms as well. Uh, the fourth book that I published, this one is a nonfiction book as well. It's called My Beautiful and Loving Wife. And uh, remember when I told you guys, I, I, uh, when I uh, got into writing books in prison, people used to pay me to write to their significant others for them. So uh, I'm, that does I'm not good. be one of them right there. You feel, you feel so I'm good with the romance, right? I'm 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 good with putting putting my my heart, my thoughts, my emotions, my feelings on paper. And so what I wanted to do, I wanted to surprise my wife one year for uh, our anniversary, our ten year anniversary. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to write her a book, a book that's all about her and all about our relationship and all about how I feel about her. And the things that we've been through over our life that that made me fall so madly and deeply in love with her. And so I have uh, pictures in this book, in this book as well. Uh, my wife, our family members, uh, our children, how we met, um, some of the ups and downs of the relationship. And I really put my heart on paper and explained uh, why I feel like I feel about it. And I actually That's finished it um, before I expected to. So instead of saving it for our anniversary, I gave it to her for a birthday. That's right? Dope. I gave it to That's her for dope. a birthday. But this was the fourth book I published. This all true. This is about my relationship with my beautiful wife. You know, I, I love her. Uh, I, I wouldn't be the man that I was with, without her right by my side. Now, the um the next 12 books that I published, uh, Tim kind of mentioned this a little earlier when he was talking about my, my morning motivation. Morning Motivation with Matthew Daniels. This is a 12 book series that I wrote last year. See, I said this is volume one, uh, volume two, and it's a uh, 12 different volumes. And I'm going to show you all of the coverage, but let me explain what it is. Um, if you've been here for the entire time, if not, you can go back to the beginning and you can um, listen to the beginning. But I, 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 morning, it's called Morning Motivation with Matthew Daniels, volume one through 12. It's 12 different books. Okay. And um, what I was saying in the beginning was that um, in order, if, if you're coming from a background like me and my brother Tim, right, and, and you have been swallowed up by the streets, you see, and you're trying to change your life and do something better. You want better for yourself. You want better for your children. You want better for your husband or wife, your significant other. You want better for your parents. You want better for your siblings. It's not enough to change your behavior. That may sound weird, but listen to me. I'm, I'm telling you from experience. It's not enough to simply try to change your behavior. You have to change how you think because your thinking dictates your behavior. And what happens is if you never change your thinking and you only try to focus on your behavior, something's going to happen in life to where you're going to react before you think it through. 
And when you react before you think something through, you're going to default to whatever your mind state is at. Whatever, whatever type of mind state you have, if you have that mind state to where you don't give a fuck about nothing and nobody, you don't give a damn if you go back to prison, you willing to do it, you willing to do the time, you don't care about hurting people, you, you know what I'm saying, you like, you know what, I'm not going to hurt nobody, but I don't give a fuck about hurting somebody, right? You're like, I'm not actually going to get out there and rob nobody, but hey, if I get down bad enough, I got to eat. If you have that type of mind state, what's going to happen is you're going to get into a situation to where you're going to be forced to react in the blink of an eye. And your your body, your mind, your body is going to default to that negativity that you put in it. So you have to change your thinking. So when you react off default, you react off the understanding of, hey, I got a wife, I got children, I can't go back. I, I can't go back. I, I, I can't put myself in that position. And you're going to do something to get out of that situation without ruining your life. And so um, earlier, Tim, you asked me, uh, uh, how do I stay so focused? How do I stay focused enough to write 16 books in the first place when I have a job, when I have a wife, when I have three children? How do I stay so focused to where I, I, I self-publish them myself? I write them myself. I edit them myself. I spell check myself. How do I have enough motivation to do that? Now, um, I can try to explain that to you, but I can't really I can't really explain it in, 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 in one video. You understand what I'm saying? All I can tell you is I changed my mind state. So what I decided to do is to put how I think down on paper systematically. So uh, what I did for one year straight, every day I wrote a new short story. And each short story is an analogy. It's a metaphor. It's mythology with a meaning embedded in it. The story is talking about um, um, something deeper than what the story is actually alluding to. Right. And it's all about teaching an individual how to think in order to prepare themselves for the day so that they can be successful. One of the things that I personally do every day, every day when I wake up, I tell myself, I tell myself I'm the best author in the world. I'm, I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm the best author in the world. I can write anything. I was born to write. I'm the greatest. I'm the best. You see what I'm saying? I'm a good person. I'm, I'm successful. I give myself these positive affirmations. I tell myself positive things about myself. Right. I tell myself if anything happens today, I'm going to make the right decision. If somebody does something to knock me off course today, I will not allow them to knock me off course. I will never give. I will never again give somebody control over my emotions and over my actions. I literally I tell myself that when I wake up and I tell myself that throughout the day. And so what I did every day for a year, I took some type of. um um, a concept that helps me stay focused and be successful. And I embedded that concept into a story. I told the concept an, in an analogous form and I put it into a story. And at the end of the story, I explained what the story means to make sure that an individual can get it. And right. I did it in such a way to where, let's say volume one. Volume one is 30 short stories that can correspond with one month of the year. It's 12 books in the series because it's 12 months in the year. And it's a total of 365 stories. So an individual can go on a journey with me for one year straight, if you wake up in the morning and you read a story three, three pages long, you get the motivational concept behind it, you get the message behind it, you put yourself in the right frame of mind before you start your day so that if something comes up, your default is positivity. Are, these, default sold, is are these sold individually or are they sold yes. as a set? Yes, yes. Each each one is... um. Um, sold individually again on Amazon, Walmart, Barnes and Nobles, but Amazon is good. 
And I'm gonna tell you like this. Hold on, look. Huh? When he he before he started this journey where he was gonna write a story every single day, he told me that he was gonna do it. And I said, Man, that's crazy. I said, Ain't no damn way, man. That's crazy, right? And what did mm -hmm. he do? He he got a tour. <laughs> and I didn't believe I I mean, so I believed you when you told me that you wanted to. I believed you that you're planning on going to. But I didn't really think it was going to happen. I ain't going to lie, right? There's very few human beings in this world that's really going to say that and do that, bro. And you did that. Yeah. And see, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you, fam. That was four. This five. I'm going to be honest with you, bro. I didn't plan on doing this. It just kind of it kind of happened organically. What I did was I started making a video every day. Right. And I would like tell a short story and I would like give somebody like a motivational message each day. And so what I at first what I did, since I read a lot, I was taking stories that I knew. It could be a story from the Bible, a story from Greek mythology, Roman mythology, Egyptian mythology. And I would use that story to give the people a motivational message. But eventually what happened was I ran out of stories to use. And so as I was making these videos to inspire people every day, I told myself, you know what? Uh, somebody in history wrote these stories that I'm using. You feel me? Somebody in history wrote these stories that I'm using. Can you so read I that comment myself, on the screen? Uh, hold on. That's passion, bro. He's a real bro. Raised down the street from them on 17th before they moved to the new. Okay, okay. That's somebody that okay. Hotel. Hotel. Shout out. Shout out, I man. Even, I, I, I don't even know that. who that is. I'm not me used neither. to seeing that name. So who yeah, is that? Me neither. But hey, shout out. And I, I I I I appreciate that. See, one thing my daddy always told me: you want to live your life in such a way that somebody will speak good about you when you're not even in the room. So the yeah. fact for him to get up there and say, hey, he's a, he's a real bro, I appreciate that. Because you always want to have somebody to speak good about you when you're not in the room. You don't want people when your name come up, everybody, you know, everybody, like, oh, he low down, he dirty. <laughs> you feel me? He can't be trusted. Uh -huh. You want people Thanks. to say, no, he, 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 you know, he got a good heart. He mean what he say. He so about where'd, you get this, where'd you get all these covers from? Is your wife making these? Uh, well, yeah, um. The first few, my wife actually took the pictures herself. She took the pictures and she made them. Um, um, she she edited like uh, I'm gonna go to the first one. That's this just is dope as hell that she. Listen, this it's real Texas dope Dyke. that she's supporting this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, this is the Tech City Dyke right here. So she oh, took okay. this picture one day. She edited the words "Morning Motivation" with Matthew Daniels, Volume One, on it, and I, you know. I, I put it into the cover of the book. And so some of the book covers are pictures that my niece took. She had took a trip to Hawaii, a vacation, and uh, she had took some, some, some pictures. So between my, uh, between my wife taking pictures and one of my nieces taking pictures, that's why I got the covers for this series. At. Oh, so everything is original artwork and stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't get none of these pictures off the internet. Uh, this this actually is my wife right here. The one I said about my wife, that's my wife. Yeah, I wasn't that's her face. That nobody. ain't just an internet picture. That's my wife's picture. I used her actual picture. You see? Uh, and real quick, now that, now that we mentioned it, uh, this right here, remember when, earlier when Tim said he saw somebody with Tech City on their back? That Texas City is on a tattoo on my back, and this is the tattoo. It's kind of blurry, but you see that guy sitting on a tombstone? I have a picture of a guy that represents me sitting on a tombstone. And at the at placed on that tombstone is bottle of alcohol, is guns, is uh is drugs, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And I have my name on the tombstone. And symbolically, what that represented was I, again changing my mentality. I mentally buried that guy. That guy that was willing to terrorize his community, I killed him, never to be resurrected from the grave. And I got that tattoo on my back of myself sitting on my own tombstone because I was burying that guy. 
who rode around with guns, doing drugs, robbing and stealing and hustling and stealing cars. I buried him. I, I knew I had to bury him. You see? But uh yeah, so all all of these uh book covers, they're 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 pretty much original. I got I, I came with these pictures myself, you know. And even with the with the morning motivation, um, like I say, when I realized that I was using stories to motivate people that somebody else had wrote, uh Greek mythology, Roman mythology, the Bible, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, I said, you know what, I'm an author, I can write stories myself. You see, I've already convinced myself that anything in the world that somebody else can do, I can do. That's how I went from flipping burgers at McDonald's to being a general manager running the store. Because I looked at the general manager and I told myself, if you can do it, I can do it. If you can do it, I can do it. So if somebody else can write these stories, I can write these stories too. You feel me? And so I started writing my own short stories. And so after I wrote the first 30, um, what happened was I was, um, I just had like a stack. I was writing them by hand on paper, like I was doing in prison. And I had in my, in my home, like a, a stack of papers with just stories written on them. And when I was looking at them, I told myself, I say, uh, I say, man, you know what? I say, this looks like a book itself. It, I, 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 I could see it. It was stick. I was like, damn, all these stories is a book. And so I was like, man, I could put all of these short stories into a book. And so I picked out 30 of them that I had already written. I typed them up. I uh, I, get, I got my wife to make me a cover and I made it a book. And I was like, you know, morning motivation with Matthew Daniels. You feel me? Because that's what I was saying in the videos. I was like, you know, good morning, good morning. Welcome back to morning motivation. With yeah, Matthew you know, Daniels. I was watching. Yeah. 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 And so, um, when I did the first book, my wife asked me one day, she say, uh, cause I was just doing these stories every day at this point. She was like, how long are you going to do this? Like how many stories are you going to do? And so I was, I told her, honestly, I, I don't know. I didn't really think about it. I, I'm just doing it every day. And so she said, you know what? You should do 365. You should do one story for each day of the year. Like one of those daily motivationals where you could get like a, a, a quote, a quote a day or a Bible verse a day with a message behind it. And I thought just like you, Tim, in my mind, I was like, ain't no way I can do this for a whole year. I can't write 365 stories like back to back to back, nonstop every day, come up with a new new characters, new setting, new concept, new message. And I can't, how can I do that? And I got a job, I got a wife, I got three children. But what happened, and I'll be honest with you, bro, my wife was so excited when she said it. And I saw in her eyes that she believed I could do it. As a man, I was like, man, my wife, if my wife believed in me that I can do it, I believe in me that I can do it. If she say I can do it, damn it, I, I can do it. Now you know I feel me? bad for saying I didn't think he was going to do it. Yeah, no, don't. I thought the same thing. It took me a while before I told the public, before I told people like you, at first I didn't say that's what I was doing. Right. I just told her because right. I was like, if I say it and I don't do it, then people going to be like, remember when Matt said that he was yeah. going to write. You know, what, you know what I what I never told you? So yeah. when, I, when I started Texas Prison Stories, a YouTube channel, right? I didn't tell nobody I knew personally until I hit 4,000 subscribers because I was scared I was going to fail and look stupid. Yeah. Yeah. I'm serious. And well, it was two reasons, right? One, yeah, I was scared I was going to fail, look stupid. Like this man's here telling personal stories and nobody cares. You know what I mean? But thankfully that didn't happen. And, and I was just scared to fail, right? I didn't want to do it publicly. I'm not scared to try things and fail, but I don't want to make a spectacle out of myself but in other words i just didn't want anybody to like take the idea and catch up and try to you know do what i was doing so i announced it once i felt like i had a pretty good head start but when you told people me and, and other folks that hey i'm really fixing to do this one story a day now you now you you hey you said that now we're looking for a story every day you know what i mean and then you started dropping out a video every day too i'm like oh this dude is a maniac this man is a machine you know what i mean so that'll take me back 
to King Wow. What I say, I've been trying to get your brother back on my channel forever, but every time I go to call him, I look and he's live. He's the same mm -hmm. way, hard working men. You know what I'm saying? The hardest working men in show business. Matt, listen, I'm gonna let you close it, bro, because I've been up since 5 a.m. Man, I sure appreciate that. You know, I've told you a million times, man. Anytime you want to, this this is like your platform too, bro. I really mean that. You know what I'm saying? And you you wouldn't be here if you were promoting any type of gang shit. If you were doing any silliness or anything i'm proud of you man i know these people right here see a good change in you so i'm gonna let you do me a favor close with a message on why these people don't want to go to prison that's what that's what i want you to do and i'm gonna sign out after you're done okay uh i'm gonna say it like this thank you for having me on the platform let me say that first i appreciate you uh you always been real from day one since i met you even from when we were living how we shouldn't have been living up until now and we're trying to get it get it together uh, i appreciate you for letting me come on and uh even speak my truth and in addition to speak my truth even even talk about my books because my books are my passion um being an author that's 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 my passion i love talking about it and i love promoting that to the people uh and what i what i want to say is um you only live once and I'm, I'm gonna end it like this when i was in prison the last time i talked to a lot of guys that had big time 50 years, life, 30 years, 75 years, 60 years. And every last one of them regretted what they did. They regretted what they did. And so um, you may not, you may not comprehend it now because, you know, you're on the outside. You can go where you want to go. You can do what you want to do. You can live how you want to live. You have opportunities, right? You've been blessed with life itself. Just just the ability to be here, wake up in the morning, go where you want. Now, of course, you may be limited by your finances and circumstances, but generally you you have the opportunity to make something happen. And 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 while you're here on Earth, you do not get younger. You only get older. OK. And so uh, one of the things I realized about going to prison, it, it is a waste of time and time is life. It is a waste of your life, okay? Time that you can never get back. You understand what I'm saying? You you can go in when you're 19 and you can get out when you're 30. That wasn't my experience, but I'm just saying. You can get out when you're 30 and you can never go back and turn 21 with your family, turn 22 with your family. You can't go back and get that time over. If you have children, and you go to prison, you can't go back and attend them birthdays. They're going to grow up without you. If you have a wife or a husband, you can't go back and experience those anniversaries that you missed. You can't go back and experience Christmas, Thanksgiving, or whatever holidays, birthdays, whatever, whatever holiday is on important to you. You can't go back. Prison is a waste of time, and time is life that you can't get back. The, 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 the biggest atrocity is giving away your life to a system that doesn't even care about you uh uh uh, uh dishonoring and disrespecting the, the 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 beauty of life itself the ability to have free will and have choice and to achieve your dream goals and ambitions there is no dream that you can really well well i'm saying there's no dream that you can actually have when you are born that you can uh, uh actualize in prison you're always going to be hindered i would not be able to do this how I'm able to do it if I was doing 20, 30 years in prison. So I just want to leave you guys with this. Everybody on planet Earth, whether you know it or not, you came to Earth for a reason. You're here for a reason. There is something inside of your heart that you want to do, that you desire to do, somewhere you want to go, something you want to see, something that you want to experience. And you throw that away when you give your time to that sale and you put yourself back and you miss out on time that you could be using to actualize your dreams and your goals. So I implore everybody to not only change their behavior, but to also change the way that you think. Never give them the opportunity to lock you up in a cell because when they lock you up in that cell, you lose time and time is your very life itself. Don't give your life to this system. And I'm going to leave y'all on that. Man, thank you, brother. I appreciate the video, man. I'm going to close myself, right? And uh, salute. I'll call you tomorrow, all right?
All right, man. Hotel, man. Appreciate it, bro. All right. Thank you. So Texas Prison Stories family, y'all see why I had him on the channel, right? This is a real good dude right here, man. He's a personal friend of mine. You can tell from his past stories to what he's talking about now. You can see personal growth. You can see a man that's an actual leader of his family, of his community, the same way he was in the gang life in prison. You know what I mean? And what he said, one thing I'll say, years wasted. I'm glad my brother said that. I talked today to one of my best friends. He's serving 40 egg. He's got 11 done, nine more to go to his first parole attempt. When he left, his daughter was three years old. I asked him today how old she was, and she's 14. That hurt my heart because my daughter's five right now, and I could not imagine coming home when she was 16. And he's got nine more years to even try. He left when he left when his daughter was three. And his first attempt to even come home will be when she's 23. And he loved his daughter. So I want y'all to think about that, man. It's not only us as men, us as grown women that we affect, but we're leaders. We're needed. We Our family needs us. We need them. And just think about it, y'all. This is not the life you want. Thank you for watching. If you hang in here, we did it for a long time. I know it's Friday. A lot of people got a lot of things to do. But we appreciate it. Y'all check out his book. It's on Amazon. All They are on Amazon. This is the one that he recommends you get right here. Suicide Notes. And I, it is a good book. I read it myself. I promise you'll like it. It's based in Dickinson, Texas, which is here in Galveston County. It's a Texas book by a Texas author and one of my friends. Y'all Texas Prison Story family salute. Thank you for watching.